left order. Got a nice crowd here. I'd like to say welcome to each and every one of you. Glad to have you with us tonight. The first thing on the agenda is the swearing in of the council members and myself. Uh, we, uh, myself will be sworn in. Council member Sluta Anthony, Council member Marion L. Holloway Jr., Council member Franco McGee. At this time, we'll do that. Mr. Robinson, you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. I want to come all come down at the same time. You want one at a time? How you do one at a time? One at a time. Council member 
according to the best of your skill and ability and according to law. So help you God. Congratulations. Look this way a minute. Gotcha. Put on panel, right? Come on, photo bomb it, Frank. Say it a little bit more. Hey, how you doing, girl? Good to see you. How you doing, sir? You too. You too. Or he's getting ready to start. You're going to break the camera. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like I'd like to say uh, congratulations to Ms. Anthony, um, uh, Marion Holloway Jr., and Franco McGee, and welcome to the council. We're glad to have you, folks. Thank you. And uh, item number two, election of uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and uh, I think the attorney is going to give us some insight. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, congratulations to our new members of the council uh, for the Mayor Pro Tem election. Uh, what you are required to do at, your, at this meeting is select the mayor pro tem. How you do it typically is governed by Robert's rules in that the mayor will open the floor for nominations. 
individuals may nominate, members of council may nominate other members to serve as mayor pro tem, obviously except for the mayor. Uh, as the mayor can't be nominated to be mayor pro tem, he can't serve both offices. Um, although that might get him two votes, he may think. But it, so what you'll do is you'll have the nominations. Once the nominations are completed, there'll be a motion to close the nominations, and then you'll vote on the candidates, uh, depending on how many number of candidates there are. If there it turns out there's only one candidate, then uh, you could move to approve by acclamation. If there are two or more, then I would ask the mayor to then read the name of the candidate to be voted for, and by a show of hands, members of council would then vote to select that mayor pro tem. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them for the council. Just a quick question. Um, the nomination from uh, from a council member for another council member, does that require a second or does that nomination just put them into the, um, their name into the, uh, the running for the mayor pro tem? The nomination does not require a second. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, we have a, do I have a motion on Mayor Pro Tem? I have a motion um, for the Mayor Pro Tem's position, uh, Mayor. Um, I would like to nominate Saluda Anthony. Uh, for the first time since 2009, we find ourselves uh, on the Monroe City Council with only one woman serving as a, a council person. Uh, personally, I think that... Um, it has a unique perspective to our leadership when we have a woman that is a part of the uh, that leadership team. Uh, and uh, we've had a woman that has either been mayor or been uh, mayor pro tem uh, on the council for quite a number of years. Uh, Ms. Anthony has availed herself to attend uh, both state and national meetings. She's attended the North Carolina League municipalities where she's gathered a lot of insights, so, uh, met a lot of friends for the city of Monroe as well as for herself in uh, making herself a better person to serve the citizens of Monroe. In addition, she has attended uh, many meetings for the uh, National League of Cities where she has done the same thing. Uh, and she is the only council member over the past uh, four years uh, during her tenure that has, uh, has done that. And um, it uh, really helps you uh, to become a seasoned uh, elected official when you mingle with other elected officials. So I would like to offer the nomination of uh, Saluda Anthony as Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor, I'd like to offer a uh, nomination of uh, Gary Anderson as Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Mayor, if I may, if I'm not out of order, I'm going to respectfully withdraw my name. I do feel that I'm worthy of the position I have applied myself and worked diligently for the city of Monroe, but I understand there's a prearrangement, and in lieu of that, I know I would not have the votes. So with that in mind, I will respectfully withdraw my nomination. Okay. Uh, the council member Anthony has chosen to not accept the nomination. It would be up to the nominator if he wishes to keep her name in nomination if he wishes to withdraw the nomination in accordance with the wishes of the uh, nominee, that would be sufficient. If not, then you would go ahead and vote uh, on both because the nominator has placed the individual's name in nomination. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Anthony's position, and she's uh, very full aware of how business uh, is conducted again she has availed herself to to attend many meetings um, but um, I think I will uh, respectfully leave her name in nomination so that her name can be voted on at this time okay. along with the other person whose name was <coughs> mayor I would if there were no other nominations I think you should ask for if there are any additional nominations and if there are not ask for a motion to close nominations so okay. move okay no other nominations have a motion to move to have a second i second that uh, the nominations motion. be closed all in favor close Aye. Uh, okay the nomination is closed mm -hmm. which one you take I, I would suggest in the order presented so council member anthony okay please, sir uh, all in favor of councilman anthony uh on mayor pro tem please raise your hand okay one two well uh, for no council uh, this is just a Make clear it's to vote for Councilmember Anthony. That's uh, and then the second would then be to vote for Mr. Anderson. But it's it's you can only vote for one. Okay. 
All in favor, Councilman Anthony, Mayor Pro Tem, please raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, for Mayor Pro Tem, uh, and then for Mr. Anderson, sir. Yeah, I'm trying to read my notes here. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Gary Anderson, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, four. Okay, uh, Mr. Anderson, you'll be Mayor Pro Tem. Go to the vote. Thank you, sir. All right, consent agenda. Uh, Larry, at this time, we have the consent agenda. Uh, Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, City Council uses the consent agenda to consider items that are non controversial and routine. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Council. Items may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a Council member or citizen with the consent of Council. The consent agenda contains the following items. Item number three is for the purpose of adopting a budget amendment in the amount of $336,000 for the necessary roof repairs and replacement to secure and stabilize the Inquirer Journal building, which was previously purchased by the city. Item four is for the purpose of calling for a public hearing to be held on January 9th of 2018 to consider a zoning map amendment request to be rezoned property located at 1730 Morgan Mill Road from Conditional District Stack Business Center Amendment 1 to Conditional District Alvarez. Excuse me, I, uh, I apologize. Uh, the, the, the money that we're going to use for the uh, roof repair on the Inquirer uh, Journal building, uh, can that be uh, rolled into the financing that we're going to have on that building? Um, so, so even though we will put it out now, expend it now, it can be put down as a part of the financing on the building. So it'll go back into the general fund. Um, we can if we adopt a, res a reimbursement resolution to be able to do that. Um, I don't know if we can do that. Can we add that? Not it, what I would suggest is, is first if there is going to be further discussion on this item, I would suggest that Councilmember Jordan then pull it from the consent agenda and then can ask these questions and, and pull that and then um, I would, like have to have properly this, considered. I would like to have this removed from the consent agenda for Thank further you. discussion. Thank you, Councilmember Jordan. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, item five, uh, for the purpose of awarding this contract to Vasco Lighting in the amount of $180,000 for the purchase and installation of replacement lighting for Don Griffin Park uh, softball baseball fields. Item six is for the purpose of approving the Monroe Garden Club's request for a City assistance in watering of seven art planters should be placed along Main Street in downtown Monroe. Item seven is for the purpose of approving the Monroe Garden Club's request to install and maintain a 100 foot by 25 foot pollinator garden in the memory of Edith Harden to be located on the Johnson Street side of Greenway. Item eight are minutes and reports lettered 8A through 8H. Item 8A involves disbursements for fiscal year 2017 to 2018 for city council discretionary funds. There are three sets of disbursements by the governing body for this period. First was Councilmember Anderson disbursed $250 to the Union County Community Shelter. Second set of disbursements was from Councilmember Freddie Gordon involving three disbursements to the following. Turning point in the amount of $1,000 a few good men in the amount of $1,000, and Union County Community Shelter in the amount of $1,000. Third set was, was from Councilmember Lynn Kaziah, who dispersed $500 to Union County Community Shelter. Item 8B are financial reports for October and November, and as a summary through November 2017, total fund balance is $27 million and change. The unsigned general fund balance is four. 4.8 million in change, and the total assigned fund balance is 1.8 million in change. There are five sets of minutes lettered 8C through G. Item 8H is summary of contracts awarded, change orders approved, and city manager settlement of claims. There are 23 contracts for the period totaling $354,000 in change, and there are no claims settled for this period. Item 9 is for the purpose of approving an ordinance that authorizes the use of cash funds as an appropriate means of satisfying the city's obligations. Item 10 are, involves two resolutions, the first of which, I'm sorry, three resolutions. The first of which is for the purpose of calling a public hearing to be held on January 9th, 2018, to
to consider the abandoning a portion of the Heath Street right of way by request of Kathy Bragg, Executive Director of the Union County Community Shelter. Uh, actually, that was 8 or 10B. 8A or 10A is for the purpose of approving the airport's list of future capital improvements for inclusion in the NCDOT Aviation's planning grant programming system for the period uh, 2018 to 2024. Item 10C, the third resolution, is for the purpose of adopting resolution that proposes acceptance of Mr. Bert Berneski's offer of $20,000 followed by a newspaper advertisement to begin the upset bid process related to his purchase offer of 2.2 acres of land that is no longer needed for the airport's instrument landing system. Item 11. Excuse me. I'd like to pull 11 off. Um, the uh, item C. Yes. No, 11. 11. Uh, 11? Yeah, 11. Yeah. City Council meetings mm -hmm. and scheduled events. Yeah. Okay. Item 12 is utility fee uh, grant program fee waiver request by Union County Community Development Corporation is for the purpose of approving the distribution of funds for the cost of three utility connections in the amount of $15,108 as, as requested by uh, the uh, um, Monroe Union County Community Development Corp. Item 13. It's for the purpose of approving revisions to the water and sewer standard specifications and details manual. Mayor, members of City Council, this concludes my synopsis of items placed on the consent agenda for your consideration. I move that it be approved with the exception of the two that were pulled. Okay. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Uh, 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 that is passed, and we'll go to item <coughs> three. Uh, Say item three. Huh? Is it three? Yes. Yeah, three. three. Item three. Uh, we'll go to item three. Um, Mayor, I just wanted to to some clarification on that. Um, I know that, that on the surface it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it, it appears that every time we come to um, a city council meeting that our discretionary uh, spending money becomes less and less. And um, um, and if there is a way for us to finance, you know, three to four hundred thousand dollars for a roof repair into the financing of the project. I would like to see us do that. If it's not possible, then it's not possible. But uh, <coughs> I would like to see us do it if we can. Okay. Mayor, I think at the time uh, the finance director was sort of answering the question and about uh, the possibility of whether or not it could be done, depending on if Councilor Ann Jordan still has that question. I still, I still have a question. Um, in order to do that, we would need to have the add a reimbursement resolution to this item. Uh, that would allow us to uh, you know, make the expenditure and reimburse ourselves when we do uh, the financing, whatever kind of financing we'll do for whatever projects we decide on. Uh, does what, uh, what type of uh, legal uh, uh, ramifications would that have? Uh, or do we already have financing in place that this would jeopardize if we no. decide it would not? Okay. No. Lisa, could we not go ahead and fund it out of the discretionary fund with the understanding that uh, when the financing's in place, that that money will go back into the general fund? That's that's yes. what I'm asking that we do. Yes, I'll and that, your motion. Okay. that would just require that the approval of a reimbursement resolution to be well, able to do that. I make a motion that, that we, we uh, I'll I'll have a, a reimbursement second resolution motion. for that. I have a motion. Have a second. Lynn, did you suck it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a motion to suck it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here, none, none opposed. And Mayor, that, that yeah. only, I think, uh, requires then the reimbursement resolution. Now you need to move approval on the item itself. Okay. As amended. Okay, I make a motion that uh, um, item number three, budget amendment for inquiry drone building roof repair and replacement be approved. I have a motion. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All approved. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> item. Uh, 11, I believe it is, Ms. Anthony. Yeah. I requested that, that that be taken off. I know we already have our meeting schedules, but I'd like to make a motion that we return to our strategic planning sessions. Um, I feel that it's necessary for us to meet prior to, to coming to council. If not, we'll send information at the same time to citizens. That does not give us the opportunity to actually repair 
prepare for the meetings, and I don't think we can serve our citizens well not meeting prior to, to our council meeting. Okay. Any questions? Comment? It's not meeting at 4 o'clock. Time to be, to be set. Okay, time to be set. I don't have a problem. You're talking about every every council meeting at four, coming at four. You talking about if 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 there's some time that we don't have much on that, then you have the authority to cancel the strategic okay. planning. But I do think we need when we that. need when we need to to do that, like we that is said. Correct. Okay, I'll second. Any questions on that? I got a motion and a second. Mayor, yes. can I ask for some clarification? Is it so? It would be the four o'clock of every council meeting on this current schedule with the exception of where you already have a strategic, uh, would be a strategic planning meeting. Is that correct? Is that, that is the correct. intent of the... Of with the, the mayor uh, retaining authority to cancel it if it's not necessary. Okay. okay. Well, I'll look, for, I'll look for the city manager and attorney to brief me on what we need to do and go from yeah. there. Is that okay with the council? I just wanted to... We, I think uh, the clerk and I were just trying to make sure that we had the motion properly set and understood that your intention is that you're, you'll have a 4 o'clock meeting on the day of every regular council meeting where there is not already a strategic meeting already right. scheduled. I think that's and it mean, would not yeah. apply to special meetings or anything else. It would only be for your regular meetings. That only are regular meetings. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion. I have a second. Second, Jim. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here, none. That passed. Very good. Okay. That moves us down to our regular agenda. Uh, item 14, presentation comprehensive annual financial <coughs> report, fifth year, June. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council. I'm Ashley Ivey, a county manager in the city's finance department. Um, I come to you tonight. We have a Mrs. Elsa Swat, Swat, Watts from uh, Martin Starnes and Associates, our auditing firm. She's here tonight to provide present the highlights of our annual audit. And you have should have with you a copy of the spiral bound, the actual financial report, um, if you'd like to reference that at all. So I will um, present Elsa Watts. Good evening, Mayor, Manager, Council Members. On behalf of Martin Starnes & Associates, I'd like to present the city's 2017 audited financial statements. Some audit highlights. The city received an unmodified opinion. This is a clean audit opinion. There are no findings, no question costs, no internal control weaknesses identified. I would like to thank Lisa Strickland and Ashley Ivey for all their hard work this year um, throughout the audit process. We are in contact with them throughout the year to plan, perform audit procedures, and follow up on uh, the CAFR. So thank you guys. It's always a pleasure working with you. Here's a look at your general fund. Um, in 2017, you had total revenues of $34.5 million and total expenditures of just over $32 million. We have comparative information presented as well, but we will detail this information further along in the presentation. The LGC defines available fund balance as total fund balance less any non-spendable items, less items restricted by state statute. The LGC uses this calculation to compare you to other units. Total fund balance for the general fund at year end was $27.3 million, less non-spendable items of just over $1 million, less items restricted by state statute of $5.5 million. This gives you an available fund balance of $20.7 million for 2017. This is a decrease from 2016 of just over $4 million, which I will explain in the next slide. This decrease in available fund balance is primarily due to the $3 million center theater renovation project, which was approved as part of the FY17 budget. In addition to that, there was a $1.1 million increase in your stabilization by state statute calculation. This is mostly due to your investment mark-to-market loss of $4.3 million, which decreased the cash balance used for that calculation. Here's a look at your revenues for the general fund. You had property taxes of 59% of your total revenues. Sales and services were 7%. Other taxes and licenses, 2%. Unrestricted intergovernmental revenues of 29%. Restricted intergovernmental revenues of 
and then you had some negative revenues due to that um, investment earning loss, just negative or minus 1%. Property taxes were $20.2 million. This is a slight increase, but overall very comparable to the prior year. Your unrestricted intergovernmental revenues, primarily your sales taxes, were $9.9 .9 million. This is about a 13% increase. This increase is attributed to increases in your sales tax and a growth in your local economy. Sales and services were $2.2 million. This is about an 8% decrease. This decrease is primarily due to a decrease in permits and fees um, due to less development in the current year. For your general fund expenditures, public safety was 59%, culture and recreation, 14%, general government, 12%, transportation, 10%, and debt service was 5%. General government expenditures were $3.9 million. This is a decrease of about 12%. This decrease is due to two plots of land that were purchased and conveyed to ATI AVAC in the prior year. Transportation was $3.2 million. Overall, very comparable to the prior year. Just a slight increase there. Public safety expenditures were $18.8 million about an 8% increase here. This is primarily due to the purchase of the Pearson Forcer pumper engine in the fire department in the current year. <coughs> Culture and recreation was at 4.5 million, again, very comparable to the year before. And here's a look at your enterprise funds. Your water and sewer fund had unrestricted net position of just over 36 million had an operating income of $4.8 million. Your electric fund had unrestricted net position of $51.4 million, operating income of $6.5 million. Natural gas had unrestricted net position of $22.2 million, operating income of $4.9 million. And your airport fund had unrestricted net position of $2.3 million, an operating loss of $1.3 million. And then your non-major enterprise funds, which are your aquatic center and fitness center, um, your stormwater and solid waste, uh, had an unrestricted net position of $3.6 million and an operating income of $386,000. And then we have some information on your cash flows from operations and unrestricted cash presented here as well. For fiscal year 18, uh, we'd like to give you some information on upcoming changes to next year's CAFR. Um, GASB 75 is a new standard uh, that affects your reporting on your OPEB. This will be a significant change next year. Um, you guys will be required to complete an actuarial study for FY18, which I, as I understand is already in process. And this will have a significant impact on your net position um, in your full accrual funds. The, me uh, the measurement and reporting of OPEB is going to significantly change next year. Um, as in prior years, uh, this has been amortized over a 30 year period. Now the entire liability will be shown on the financial statements. This concludes my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Good job, young lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thanks you to the financial department as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd just like to thank Martin Starnes, um, excellent partners to work with on the city's financial audit. Uh, they're a great resource and a very professional organization. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Item 15, public hearing, downtown residential vicinity grant to John Richardson on Windsor Street. Public hearing. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight I'm here to request your consideration for approval of a downtown residential incentive grant to Mr. John Richardson for 301 East Windsor. Mr. Richardson is the owner of that property and has submitted a request uh, for the grant to construct two residential apartments the, the, um, in, the, in the structure. It's about a 5,000 
4,500 by 5,500-square-foot structure. Uh, it was originally three units. He's brought it down to two. One of the units will be owner-occupied. Um, this conforms with the downtown master plan regarding the design and use. Um, and the um, Mr. Richardson has delayed the interior construction until this grant is approved. Right now, the interior is just a shell. Uh, the work was in progress on the exterior. Uh, the grant is for interior. Uh, the renovations and improvements as proposed uh, will have a significant effect on the revitalization of the CBD in downtown, stimulate the local economy, promote business, result in job creations. Um, the economic benefits to the form of new employment, increased tax base, property value, uh, and of course, uh, you know, utility usage on those apartments. Um, upon recommendation of the General Services Committee, which met on the 16th of November, and the Downtown Advisory Board October 24th, uh, we are requesting approval um, up to the $20 per hundred or 20% of the assessed tax value subject to compliance of the program and subject to grant fund appropriation, which the budget amendment is attached along with the resolution. I'm asking you to consider funding this approval uh, not to exceed $56,340 for this downtown residential grant incentive and award the incentive to Mr. John Richardson, uh, owner and resident of 301 East Windsor. Any questions? Is it grant is for the interior? Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I've, I've, I've <clears throat> actually got John to take me on a tour through that. That's the old J. Ray Shoot House, and uh, he's doing a phenomenal job on it. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor? Mr. Richardson is here to answer any questions if you have any. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? <coughs> Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and take action. Mayor, Move. if I could make a comment. Yes. Um, Mr. Richardson has been out of his home for over, well over a year now. Um, and I'd just like to commend him because even though he's not living there, he has kept his yard in immaculate condition. Uh, he's kept the external part of his house in immaculate condition. He's, uh, I know I've seen him over there uh, a number of times uh, mowing his yard and uh, keeping it uh, just looking as if someone were living there, even though he and his family are not. And um, when we have an owner that takes that much uh, pride in their, in their downtown home, uh, I, I know I appreciate that, um, and I know the surrounding community members in that area appreciate that. Uh, I make the motion that we approve this incentive grant to Mr. John Richardson. I second, I second the motion. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That will be approved, Mr. John. Item 16. Uh, Historic landmark designation property located at 600 South Church Street. This is a public hearing also. Good evening, I'm Carrie Hutchins with the Planning Department. Tonight I'm <coughs> presenting a historic landmark request for the Wolf Ashcraft House located at 600 South Church Street. The request is for the exterior of the house, the grounds, and a portion of the interior that includes the mantles from the original house, the dining room with the built-in cabinets and pocket doors, 
the staircase and the mantles from circa 1915. Um, here is an aerial of the property located on Church Street, highlighted in blue. And that is a picture of the front of the house. An application was submitted by the current owners of the property. The structure has two has a two-story portico with fluted Corinthian columns and a lunette window um, in the tantum, um, as well as a pedimented central entryway rendered um, this building an excellent uh, representative of classical revival and southern colonial revival architecture in Monroe and Union County during the late 19th and early 20th centuries when the local economy was expanding. Historic landmark designation means that the community recognizes the property as an important resource worth of preservation. Any substantial exterior design changes to a designated landmark are subject to the design review procedures of the Union County um, Preservation Commission. And the designation would allow the owner to apply for an annual deferral of 50% of the property taxes as long as the property is des designated and retains significance and integrity. The Union County Historic Preservation Commission has recommended that um, Monroe City Council adopt an ordinance designating the property known as the Wolf Ashcraft House, located at 600 South Church Street as a historic landmark. I'd be happy to answer questions you may have. Does this structure is 102 years old? Um, let's see here. Sorry. Um, it looks like it was originally built in 1874 with some, um, yeah, with some modifications in 1915. Okay. Any questions? Council, have any questions? Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> This is a public hearing. Is anyone here who'd like to speak in favor? Anyone who'd like to speak in opposition? Here, none will close the public hearing. Take action. I move that uh, we designate this property um, as a historic landmark. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, not opposed. Okay, item 17, <coughs> historic landmark designation for local property at 804 West Franklin Street. This is a public hearing also. Good evening, Carrie Hutchins again. Um, tonight I'm presenting a historic landmark request for the Seacrest Keziah McCoy Car House located at 804 West Franklin Street. The request is for the exterior of the house, the grounds, and a portion of the interior that includes the original hardware slash light fixtures, the staircase, the oak and pine floors, and the interior doors. An application was submitted by the current owners of the property. Um, the structure was constructed in circa 1925. The two-story brick veneered four-squared house has a hipped roof with wide eaves and decoratively cut outriggers. A Tuscan columned pedimented portico accents the main entrance and the west elevation has a hipped roof porch with Tuscan columns and a porter cochere extends from the east elevation. Um, again, historic landmark designation means that the community recognizes the property as an important resource worth of his um, preservation. Any substantial exterior design changes to the designated landmark are subject to design review procedures of the Union County Historic Preservation Commission, and the designation would allow the owner to apply for an annual deferral of up to 50% of the property taxes as long as the property um, is designated and retains the significance and integrity. The Union County Historic Preservation Commission has recommended that Monroe City Council <coughs> adopt an ordinance designating the property known as the Seacrest Keziah McCoy Car Kerr House located at 804 West Franklin Street as a historic landmark. I'll be happy to answer your questions. I have a question and a comment. Okay. Did, did you say it was a brick veneer? Yes. Is that not prohibited from being designated a historic landmark? Um, when they did the survey, um, this is the survey that is completed by um, somebody that has hired a third party contractor hired by the um, Preservation Commission from mm -hmm. Union County. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they have a point system that determines um, if something is eligible. Mm 
-hmm. So it must have been, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly if the brick veneer was mentioned specifically um, as to why or why not it may have been designated, but it must have had enough stones. Yeah, I was just wondering, keeping with the integrity of what uh, historic landmarks mean, I don't know if that a brick veneer prohibited or not. And, and the comment is, I passed that property a lot, it's a beautiful structure, but the yard is, the property is not, the, the land of it is not well kept. Okay. Any other questions, comment? Thank you, ma'am. This is a public hearing. Is anyone here who would like to speak in favor? Anyone here who would like to speak in opposition? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and take action. Do you have a motion? <clears throat> I move that we uh, designate the property at 804 West Franklin as a historic. I have a motion. Do I have a second? You're going to dive like a motion? I'll second. I have a motion and a second. I lived in that house for 17 years. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Any comment? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, uh, Any opposed? No. I have one, one, op one opposed. Okay. Item 18, another public hearing, limited obligation bonds, series 218, public hearing. Good evening. I'm Lisa Strickland, the finance director for the city. Uh, back in November, uh, staff was authorized by the initial resolution to begin the necessary steps to issue limited obligation bonds series 2018. This debt will be used to finance the construction of a liquefied natural gas peaking facility. A public hearing is being held today to receive public comments on amendment number two to this installment financing. Uh, it was originally dated back in January 1st, 2009 when we constructed the gas pipeline. Uh, the city wishes to amend this 2009 agreement in order to facilitate the issuance of limited obligation bonds for the peaking facility. Uh, North Carolina statutes require that a public hearing be held to hear public comments prior to entering into a contract involving real property improvements. Staff will seek approval of the amendment and seek authorization of the issuance of the bonds in February. Uh, we anticipate closing on the bonds by the end of February 2018. Uh, the only action tonight will be the public hearing. And this is time sensitive. It's time sensitive. Uh, yes. <laughs> Any questions? Comment? Okay, none. It is a public hearing. Anyone here who would like to speak in favor? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition? Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing and take action. No action required. No action required. Okay, very good. Uh, item 19, zoning map amendment, zone, rezone property on Full Patton Avenue. This is also a public hearing. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Doug Britton, the Planning Department. And tonight, presenting the Zoning Map Amendment for 402 East Patton Avenue. The request will be made by Shank and LLC, uh, Gary Hancock of Casey's Arcade for the property located at 402 East Franklin, I mean 402 East Patton Avenue. The applicant is requesting to rezone the property from GB General Business to Conditional District 402 East Patton Avenue. <coughs> the subject property is located at the intersection of Concord Avenue, Secret Shortcut, and Patton Avenue. It's outlined in blue. It's currently improved with a strip shopping center and also a convenience store at the adjacent pro property. The property estate is currently zoned GB General Business. The property to the east south and portion of the west is GB is all well and then portion also to the west and to the north is on R10 single family residential. The applicant Gary Hancock applied for a change of use permit on May 31st of 2016. 
in order to operate a variety shop slash arcade. At the time of the application, Mr. Hancock indicated on the application he would not have any gaming operations, which may include electronic sleepstakes, bingo, or video poker. Permit was issued and signed for on June 16th of 2016. The notes on the permit stated the approval was only for arcade only. The approval did not include any type of electronic gaming where electronic machines such as computers and gaming terminals are used to conduct games of chance, including sweepstakes where cash, merchandise, or other items of value are redeemed or otherwise distributed. It's the site plan of the subject property and the applicant's request does not include any modifications to the site plan, to the site whatsoever. On August 5th, 15th of 2017, staff along with legal counsel met at the location and reviewed the operation of the gaming machines. Based on observation of the play of the games and after consulting with legal counsel, staff determined that the machines at the location are slot machines as defined as North Carolina General Statute 14-306 and possession of operational slot machines are illegal in North Carolina pursuant to General Statute 14-301. And within your packets also, this is the 14-301 and the 14-306, which defines them and also states they're illegal to operate within the state of North Carolina. <coughs> This was presented to the plan board and plan board did recommend disapproval of the request and staff um, representing staff here tonight along with um, <coughs> is Chuck Kitchen attorney and he has requested to make a presentation after the applicant's presentation and as well I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any questions concerning the rezoning at this time too. I have one question you said statute 14.301 statute 14.306 made it illegal in the state of North Carolina to operate gaming facilities. Did you say that? Yes. Um, Chuck Kitchen, the attorney representing us tonight, um, based on his um, application of the state statutes, he deemed them to be slot machines. And then the, the one statute basically defines them, and the other statute basically says they're illegal to operate in North Carolina. And he can probably bear it, expand on, on the slot machine aspect than I can. But, but based on our inspection, we went out to the site to see how they operated. Because um, I had seen them along, you know, over the years, but I've never seen as far as from beginning to end. And, and basically what, what happens, and, and the other people will, will speak to it more than I can, but basically you go in and you, you buy time to sit the terminal and, and play the games. Mm -hmm. And then um, when you play the games, it will tell you whether you won or not. Mm -hmm. And then when you win or not, then it prompts you to part they're calling a skill as to whether whether it'll ask you a question and based on your skill then you can win and you can basically what happens is you build up points and you can redeem those points. Now as far as the applicant they'll say, you know, from, from what they told us that if I go in there and pay twenty dollars to play, mm -hmm. I cannot leave with more than twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you build up points and you redeem those points for merchandise. They have they have anywhere from dryer sheets to radios to shampoo and sorts of things like that you can redeem your points for. So the machine does not sus sus dispense any money. It, it sounds like a bingo game the way you described it. It, it, it does not dispense shampoo. money. But that, and that's why we had Chuck Kitchen here, attorney representing staff, and he's the expert. He can, he can do it far more justice than I can try to explain it though. But do you have any other questions concerning the rezoning? Any more questions? I have one. Uh, is this the only um, game in uh, facility we have that operates like this in the city now where people uh, when they win they just get merchandise <coughs> get actual money um you want that sure. i'm looking at you because you're looking at me of course uh what, what we can say um, mr jordan is that we are aware of other establishments in the city some this is an issue with this establishment does not meet your zoning requirements that is why they've sought conditional district rezoning. There are some that do meet or grandfathered in, uh, because they existed before your zoning requirements were put in place on that. 
and there are others that just that do actually meet your requirements. I, I can't give you a number off the top okay. of my head. I believe it's somewhere between four to six establishments in the city total, but that is an issue that obviously Council's aware of. It's been a subject of much discussion okay. at the state and local level. Is it the opinion of the staff that um, once uh, uh, this um, uh, business was granted uh, the uh, permit and started operation that they skirted, you know, the integrity of our ordinance and, and started using it in a way that uh, we would not have permitted it to? We have concerns due to the fact that the representations made on the application were that it would contain no electronic gaming. Okay. So that did cause us concern, and obviously now they uh, it's it's clear that no one disputes that electronic gaming takes place on it. Okay. It's now whether or not it is legal. Right. Uh, and for our purposes, whether or not it's legal under state law, but also whether or not it meets your zoning requirements. Okay. I have a question. It's, does does another gaming facility adjoin that? There is yes. another facility that does, but it is considered grandfathered, although we are, obviously, uh, I will just note the staff continues to review other establishments in the city. And, and part of the request for the rezone tonight is the request of conditional district be to operate because the the council, council revised the definition of electronic gaming back in April. And based on <coughs> that, if you recall, we just added the word chant, I mean, skill to that definition. But prior to that, though, for the last several years, we had some guidelines. And basically what they say, and, and part of the reason for the conditional district tonight is that they are a separate business than the one directly adjacent to them in the same shopping center, but our um, separation requirements are you're required to have a four foot, 400 foot separation from any other type of gaming establishment, and also you're required to have a 400 foot separation from a residential zoning district. And the residential zoning district, if you measure from the building to the residential zone property behind this, um, is from the back of the building to that is 22 feet. So their, their request for the conditional district is to not meet those those two requirements. In that case, neither one of them meets it then, does it? Well, like um, Majib stated, the other one has been in operation since at least 2008, 2011, so that one is the grandfathered, and this one just came in, came online in, you know, in 2016. I'll just say it's summer of 2016. And also, I'll say it for the record, as far as within your packet is also the resolution um, a recommendation for the denial from the planning board as well too. And you said the planning board recommended denial. Not to. Not to approve. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. And I believe Mr. Green wishes to present and then we'll ask for Mr. Kitchen to present and then you can conduct the, if you'd like to conduct the public hearing because Bear you show me that you have quite a few speakers. Yeah well we're gonna cut that we're gonna work on that. Yes, sir. Is this an attorney? Yes, sir. I'll oh, ask him to introduce himself, sir. Uh, Travis Green, okay. Oh. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, First of all, I just want to uh, acknowledge one quick point that we this is a matter that we tabled in October and we represented to the council and we did in fact attempt to have a representative from the software companies, uh, one of the software companies involved come here and unfortunately we were unable to do that uh, through no fault of our own. We, we tried uh, very hard actually. Um, and I'm going to jump straight into a few things. Uh, to discuss uh, what uh, Mr. Britt uh, began elaborating on. When my clients initially applied for their permit, they were aware the, the uh, permit did say in the notes that no electronic gaming operation was permitted on this, this property. Well, the definition of an electronic gaming operation does include the phrase, conduct games of chance. For that reason, um, one of the reasons my client was unaware that they were violating the terms of their permit, so they by no means attempted to um, 
violate the integrity of the permit or that they actually intended uh, to do things uh, properly and have believed all along that they were operating a proper legal business and were not in any, in any way trying to violate the ordinance either. Um, and it, it is our interpretation of this ordinance as well as state law that really what this comes down to is whether or not we're discussing games of chance versus games of skill. Um, in your package, you have the definition of a slot machine. Well, a, Mr. Kitchen and staff, that is what they have categorized these machines as, as slot machines. Well, that's not actually the way the courts have used these machines. The, the courts have used these machines as what is more commonly referred to as a sweepstakes machine. Now, I use that term, that, that's, that's the way they've been defined, and the reason for that is there is actually no purchase necessary to play these games. You can go in and you can play them to a certain extent without having to give any money to anyone. You uh, purchase uh, coupons and through those you can gain more credits and play further. Um, so by, ha by being no purchase necessary, that makes them not slot machines. And the case, let's see here, where is it at? Sandhill and uh, Amusements Inc. That is really the only case on point and unfortunately has not ultimately finalized the ruling, um, but they established that this is under sweepstakes law, this is not under slot machine law. If it was under slot machine law, it would be very cut and dry and we, would really, we, we wouldn't even be here. Um, so when the local <coughs> courts um, brought, had this case in front of them, what they were looking at was a preliminary injunction. The sweepstakes business in this matter, or, and I, I use sweepstakes but I'm going to define that in just a moment, so I'm just using that just for terminology, just so you understand um, where I'm coming from here. They were seeking to pro prohibit the, enforce, uh, the enforcement of, um, excuse me, the law enforcement from uh, collecting their machines, um, and they were wanting to continue to operate their business. The lower courts granted their preliminary injunction based on the likelihood of success. The Court of Appeals overturned that obviously uh, deciding that they did not have any likelihood of success. And then the Supreme Court, in turn, then reinstated the lower court's decision holding that there was a, a substantial likelihood of success and they granted the preliminary injunction, which is where that case unfortunately stands. So what that boils down to in those cases is whether or not this is a skill versus chance situation. And the reason I say that is because this matter falls under sweepstakes law, which is 14 dash 306.4 and that is where you get the definition of a sweepstakes and I've used the term sweepstakes a little bit loosely in my presentation so far but that actually specifically says that sweepstakes machines are based on chance which again is the reason that this comes down to a skill versus chance analysis on whether or not these machines are legal versus illegal. Now. I've pulled a couple of definitions for this, and one of them was Webster's. Uh, that's what everybody's kind of familiar with, as to what skill is and what chance is. And believe me, this is not as quite as clear-cut as these two definitions. The definitions that Sand, Sand Hill Amusements, um, what the um, Supreme Court or Court of Appeals and ultimately Supreme Court used as their definition, um, a game of chance is such a game that is determined entirely or in part by a lot or mere luck, and in which judgment, practice, and skill or adroitness have honestly no office at all. So in other words, it's, it's, like, it's like a traditional slot machine. You pull a handle, you win or you lose. Whereas a game of skill, obviously, um, your knowledge, skill, attention, um, that's what's going to assist you in gaining a victory. Now, I was really hoping we would have a presentation for you with a software developer so we could actually show you the games. The best that I could do is a few images of a, just a game that I pulled um, in order to be able to show you this. So this one's called Bath Time Bucks, uh, which anyway, um, and I will grant it does, it's designed, in fact, to look a little bit like a slot machine, which in the, uh, when, when the staff and when council were there, I'm sure that is what gave them, them the impression that they were simple slot machines. It's designed to look that way just for entertainment value. Now what happens in these games, and, and I'm going to correct Mr. Britt and I hope he'll forgive me on a few um, matters uh, where he was incorrect. First of all, again, no purchase is necessary in order to play these games and in order to get some credits. 
what you do, you see where it says play. You hit the play button and this does spin. It spins much like a slot machine. However, you are not ever going to win by chance. You can click that button as many times as you want to and it will spin, but it will, you will never win by chance. That will never happen. It is impossible. The reason it's impossible is because in order to win, you see where it says hot swap on there on this particular game, you have to select, and I wish I could get an error over there. There we go. So you have to select one of these items over here that will go into this spot. So that is why, well, that, that is the, one of the reasons why it is not chance, because you actually have to select the correct item in order to go there. Now, how do you know what to select? The answer is in these rules, and I apologize if it's a little bit small, but the important part of these rules is actually these, that, these diagrams down here. Now, these diagrams, these explain to you how you are supposed to actually win this game. So what you see is these white lines, and to be honest, uh, I'm still, trying, still figuring these games out as I go. That they're a little bit more complicated than you might would think. Um, these white lines will show you what patterns you have to create in order to win. Now, for example, in this particular one, this is a winning hand. Now, if you just look at it, you can't tell that it's a winning hand, and it's not just going to start spitting cash out to you. You're not going to get credits just by this being there. In order to get the winning hand, you have to know which pattern, which item over here on the right side is the correct item to put in this spot. Now, granted, yeah, you've got two selections, so I, mean, I guess you have a 50-50 shot, but if you know how to play the game, you'll always get this right every time. And if you saw my, one of my clients who are familiar with these games, play these games, they would put themselves out of business because they know how to play and they know how to win and you get an opportunity to win more often than not. So what happens if you select the right one, this comes up. In this case, you needed to select the orange. And so that was put here. And then you can see the pattern and that's the pattern that actually won. And so that is the only way you could win. If you would have selected the other one, you would have lost. So just sort of to sum up um, what, what I discussed about the skill versus the chance here, if you have skill-based games under the ordinance under which my client is governed, you are not considered an electronic gaming operation, which is why my client believed and why we believe that under that ordinance with her permit, she was not violating the ordinance, which means that the, the zoning violation was incorrect. <coughs> Second, Sweepstakes style games are not considered slot machines. The courts, that is what they're demonstrating when they're analyzing these under sweepstakes law, not slot machine law. And lastly, according to the, the sweepstakes statute, if you have a sweepstakes that is based on skill, then you are not violating sweepstakes law, which makes these games legal if they are considered games of skill. Now, I've got um, a decent number of people here, so I'll try not to completely um, waste your time on other items. But my client's been in business here since 2016. When she started, or when they, excuse me, when they started um, their business, they began cleaning up their parking lot, they cleaned up their area, they cleaned up, this is their actual facility. You can see they just, they just actually recently painted the floor. You can see that their computer terminals with nice, everything in here is brand new. The uh, I was standing in the parking lot when I took these pictures just to sort of give you a view of the surroundings. Basically, all that you can see from where they are positioned are commercial areas. Across the street, let's see if I can see it on this picture. On this top left picture, on the right side, unfortunately, it's cut off. That's where there is the start of residences going that way. I actually have those, the people that live in those houses are here today in favor, uh, to speak in favor of this. and. Uh, we tried to get the, the neighbor to the rear, but she has three kids, and unfortunately, I think we can all understand why she was unable to make it. Um, to the, if you're facing the facility, uh, to the far right, and you can see over here in this middle right picture, the express mark. I have the owner and operator of this store <coughs> as well. He has come to speak in favor, um, and he will explain to you why th this business being in operation is a benefit to him, how they help keep, uh, keep the parking lot clean, they keep people, unwanted people uh, from the area, you know, vagrants, and 
and then he'll also explain that there's been no increased criminal activity or anything like that since these people are here. They don't allow drugs, they don't allow alcohol, they're not open all night long, uh, they're trying to operate a clean and um, nice establishment. What are the hours of operation? I believe they close at 11, 9, excuse me? 9 to midnight. <clears throat> Um, which, Is there an age, a minimum age? Yeah, 18. 18? 18, yeah. And, and as actually Doug pointed out before, you know, there is the $20 limit. It's not like you can go in here and, you know, and I'm just going to say this word in quotes, bet your life savings or a substantial amount of money to get some sort of return as if you were going to, uh, you know, Harrah's, um, you know, Cherokee <laughs> Casino. You, you can't do that at this establishment because it's and not. you can't win, you, I understood you say you can't win money. You can only, the only money that you can get is the amount that you came in with. So if you, if you put, if you spent $10, mm -hmm. the maximum amount that you could leave with is $10. You will, you will never get more than that back. Well, I wonder why a person would waste their time if they only had $10 a lot of time and they're going to only go away with $10. That don't make sense. I can, I can only say that they enjoy it, uh, and my <laughs> client can speak more to that if needed. She has a lot more uh, familiarity with, with things like that. I understand you or someone said you buy coupons when you go in? So, so while there's no purchase necessary and you do, you can get credits every day, so you could come in there every day and play without spending any money in order to get, I guess, the maximum amount of credits that you could get in a day, you would buy coupons. Yes. What is the minimum coupon you can buy and what is the maximum? The maximum is $20. I okay. uh, don't know. Is there a minimum? There's no minimum. Now, did I also understand you say that if you wanted to, you just go down and sit down and play? Yes, ma'am. So I could go in with no money if I wanted to and just sit down and play? Yes, ma'am. I couldn't win anything, but I could just entertain you, myself? You could, you could win. Yes, ma'am. You could win. What, I mean, what could I win? If I didn't pay anything, the exact same they would be operating at a loss if they did that. If you continue to win credits and you win the games, mm -hmm. then you could ultimately win the same prize as everyone else could. With no money? With no money, yes, ma'am. I have to go play. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy a ten dollar coupon and you leave with ten dollars, how, how, how do they, how do you operate? Nobody wins. Nobody. Everybody wins, but nobody loses. Well, uh, I, I, I can let my clients speak more to the the, the, uh, the, the business <laughs> the business model. I apologize. That's fine. That's fine. I'll I'll that. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions for me? <clears throat> And I guess Mr. Kitchen wanted to, to go next. And if I, if I could have a, a brief um, moment, if uh, necessary, to rebut Mr. Kitchens, if, if needed, I would appreciate that. Here, what I'd suggest is you let Mr. Kitchen go ahead and, and write his presentation. You have a lot of individuals here to speak. And then maybe what you could do is have uh, the screen and then Mr. Kitchen you know, close it out for you uh, before you close the public hearing. That might be the. You say let Mr. Kitchen go next. Go and let Mr. Kitchen go next. Then all the individuals who are kind enough to have signed yeah. up. And, <clears throat> we'll work with that. Too. And then that way, and then you close it out with the lawyers again. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kitchen. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, yeah, please, Council. Uh, I want to address the presentation that was just made. It's the first time that uh, any of us had seen this presentation. We weren't really sure what it was going to be. There were a couple of misstatements made that I want to clarify for the council. The first thing is the Sand Hills case. Uh, in Sand Hills, you had some operators. You had an owner and operator of gaming machines sue the sheriff in Onslow County. I represented the sheriff. A preliminary injunction was issued against the sheriff in Superior Court. It was upheld by the Court of Appeals on a two-to-one uh, decision. It was reversed by the Supreme Court. There is no preliminary injunction currently in effect. Uh, subsequent to that, they did take a voluntary dismissal as to the sheriff and named the state, and so I am no longer in that case. But I did represent the sheriff at both the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. A couple of things that was stated, we did go over there, I went over with staff, there was a demonstration of the machines. There was no mention that you could play for free. What we were told was you went up, you paid your money, you got your credits, then you played. 
Also, there was no mention of a sweepstakes. As far as I can tell, there is no sweepstakes here. If it is a sweepstakes, it's a violation of federal law. And, I can, and the reason for that is you are, if you're operating a sweepstakes, you are required by federal law to state the odds of winning on the machine. I specifically asked that question, what are the odds of winning? And the answer was, we don't know. They are not posted. They don't know what the odds are. So if they want to maintain it's a sweepstakes, that's fine, but it's a clear violation of law if it is. I will submit to you that it's not a sweepstakes. The, in the Sand Hills case, I actually argued that the machines were both slot machines and an illegal sweepstakes. With a sweepstakes, you, sweepstakes in North Carolina are legal, but you cannot have what they call an entertaining display. That's what makes it illegal. If you have a display that simulates a slot machine and it's not based on skill, it is an illegal sweepstakes. That's what we had in Sand Hills, an illegal <coughs> sweepstakes. The Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, well, the Court of Appeals decision, the decision was adopted by the Supreme Court. In a footnote, it says we're not going to address the slot machine part of this because the analysis is the same for the sweepstakes part. So in essence, what the Court of Appeals dissent said and what was adopted by the Supreme Court was it's in violation of both statutes. It's both a slot machine and it's an illegal sweepstakes. As far as Webster's definition goes, it really doesn't matter. Webster's diction, uh, dictionary does not determine the law in North Carolina. The General Assembly does. You have the definitions that the Supreme Court has adopted. Let's see, can we get this back up? This is in your packet. These are the definitions from the Sand Hills case. What the, they tried to argue in Sand Hills was the old definitions which had been adopted by the Supreme Court were no longer in effect because the statute had been adopted subsequent to those court cases. The Supreme Court said, no, that's not going to fly. This is the law in North Carolina. It's been the law for a long time, and it continues to be the law. These are your definitions. A game of chance is such a game as in determined entirely or in part by lot or mere luck. Now, the interesting part, you, you heard the attorney say, you have a chance to win in the particular game he had most of the time or more often than not. It doesn't matter if it's more often or not or most of the time. That is luck. When you cannot win, no matter how skillful you are, it's a game of chance. That is luck. What was also stated, now I, uh, the particular game he um, put up was not one of the games we saw when we were over there. Most of the games, as a matter of fact, I think all the games, we saw three different games, all the games, it will tell you when you win. You don't have to do anything. It just comes, you spin, it tells you if you won or lost. And then you have to guess something or decide something at the end in order to cash out, in other words, to get your money. Now, there was a question raised, well, how do you do anything if you put in, if you pay $10, you can only get $10 back. But what was not stated is you also can win merchandise. The particular mer merchandise we saw went up to, uh, they had an Xbox, I think was the most expensive thing, which is, they had it valued, I believe it was $200. So that is the, that is the, that is the prize you can win. It's not just that you can win the amount you put in, because as uh, the councilwoman stated, nobody's going to play for $10. You put in 10s, you only get your money back, you win. If you lose, you don't get anything. Nobody's going to do that. They have merchandise. With slot machines, there's two different things you have to do to make them legal. One is, it has to be based on skill, and I've never seen a slot machine yet that's based on skill. These are just pure slot machines. You push a button, you win or lose, it's a matter of luck. The machine decides that, you don't. The second thing is, when you win something, you can't win anything that exceeds $10. Even if there, were, there was skill involved, you can't win more than $10. Here, you have a chance of winning, that's cash or merchandise, you have a chance of winning up to $200, 
the, the most expensive thing, and plus you can get more than just the one item. So you can obviously get more than $10. That's why people are playing the game. The other point I would like to make before I sit down. You have an ordinance that pre precludes electronic gaming within 400 feet of residential property, presumably because you don't think these kinds of things <coughs> should be near houses where people live. You also want to separate them out where you have to be 400 feet from another gaming establishment. In this particular situation, you're violating both of these, these provisions. What they are asking you to do is basically to eviscerate your ordinance to simply ignore what you put in it and say, oh yeah, that's fine. You can have them back to back. You can have them close to residential. That's fine. The last thing is, and I'll just put this up real quick. This is your, this is your ordinance. The last thing is that a local, state, and federal laws shall be met. What was presented to us was the payment to play a game and the particular game was an electronic slot machine. In that game, you either won or lost. If you lost, you just lost. If you won, you could get merchandise or cash in excess of $10. Now, be, now if they want to try to claim a sweepstakes, we saw no evidence of a sweepstakes. What we saw was a slot machine. Actually, they had many slot machines as a violation of state law. I submit it's a violation of your ordinance, and I would state that I would recommend, as your planning board did, that you not approve this, because you would be approving a use in violation of the criminal laws of this state. And unless you have any questions, I'll sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, do you have one? Do you have a question? Thank you, sir. Okay, we're ready to go to regular public hearing. Yes, now. sir. Okay, we'll go to regular public hearing now. We have several people signed up. We have a we have a three minute limit for speaking. Uh, if I have several, like I said, several signed up. So we, to be fair, we're gonna hold everybody to three minutes. We can I'm gonna give one four and one five and another three. So if you will bear with me and let's work together on this and and, and hold it at a three minute interval. That way we can get by this public hearing. So uh, we will time it, and uh, like I say, we'll be fair to everybody. We'll let everybody have the same opportunity, but we'll hold everybody to three minutes. Uh, okay, the uh, I have uh, this is Mr. Green here. That was the first Mr. Green is already Yeah, well, I want to be sure I'm right. Uh, Chandler, Chandler Hancock, Balkum, is that Balkum Road? Yes, ma'am. Mayor and Councilman, I'm the worst on name. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I said I'm bad with names. Oh, that's okay. So three minutes, please. Okay. I'm Chandra Hancock. Uh, I live in here in Monroe. We've been uh, operating Casey's Arcade in our uh, variety shop since 2016. When we opened there, we were a skill-based arcade. That's what we are. It does take a skill to perform to do play our system. <coughs> Next door at that time was not... Uh, doing the same thing, so we did not feel that we were next to another location. We have been an asset to the community and the area. We are friends with all our neighbors. We have signatures from the neighbors behind us, 22 feet. We have neighbors across the street from us who are here who have all signed petitions. We have helped the area grow. A lot of our customers come in from Pageland, Waitsboro, Lancaster, South Carolina. It's not just for our shop. They also asset the community and the area and the other local stores around us. Um, I don't feel that we have ever tried to misinterpretate ourselves with the city. We have been straight up and forward all along. Our doors are always open. We welcome you to come in and see what we do. A lot of our members are, count well, some councilmen, some church deacons, some professionals. We have attorneys. We have everyone come in. And this is some place they come in, they relax, they sit down. It's a family environment. Like I said, we don't allow anything in the area that is illegal. We don't allow any illegal property or um, drugs, drinking, anything in the location. We're not open 24 hours. 
We don't believe that anyone needs to be there 24 hours a day. Um, we've just tried to bend up and straight along. All, I don't. And if anyone has any questions, I'm just. Okay. You okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This one's in favor. I should have said that. Mr. Hancock, Hancock, I'm sorry. Hey, Mr. Hancock. You give us your name and address for the, for the board, please. My name is Gary Hancock, 711 Balkan Road. Uh, my wife and I are residents of Monroe. Uh, we have <laughs> opened our business. We've been open for approximately a year and a half. In that time, we have been an asset to the community. We, uh, we believe very much in paying forward and we have helped numerous members of the community. We've also given quite generously to local uh, charities as well. Uh, <clears throat> as to the, the reason that we're here, uh, I, the, uh, I'm not sure what the purpose is for the, dip, the, the space requirements and what have you. Uh, but I think you'll find that the people that are here tonight that uh, that are within that space that we seem to be violating will tell you that uh, that we are not a detriment to the community whatsoever and that uh, as my wife stated the the business that is right next to us uh, when we opened they were not operating as what they were grandfathered in for therefore we opened up as we did thinking that that we are not we were in violation of, of that particular part of this issue uh, we have been open for a year and a half. We have, until until just recently, this we've never had a problem. I'm uh, I'm a little confused as to why this suddenly has become such an issue. Um, uh, as Mr. Green did state, we uh, we do maintain the parking lot for the entire shopping center. Uh, we we do provide the uh, business and revenue to the other the other customers, the other the other businesses within that within that. Uh, uh, shopping center as well uh, we provide a meal on every Friday night for anyone who who would like to come in and, and partake of that meal uh, we don't require anything for that it's just something we do for the community uh, we look at our customers as our family and we run a family business and we have never had an issue uh, legally or otherwise and uh, uh, I I would just like to ask that the that the uh, city council take in the, the, these things into account uh, when you decide uh, whether or not to give us this conditional rezoning. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, I can't make the name out. Hagler, four hundred Patton Avenue. Um. Yes, we're on a beef. My name is Rahan Haile. Uh, I own the Express Mart, and those, those uh, business is helpful for me, and my business is up, and uh, they are sunrise. It's very good cleaning the parking lot. I do the grass, and uh, even the state lottery who was up when they come. So my it's a very benefit for me. Uh, we don't have any problem. Any problem we have over there is we take care. Of it. You know, we just follow. We not we are friendly with the neighborhood and uh, just like our, our family. So this business is very helpful for me thank you thank you sir mr holly could you spell your name for the record that way we have it in the minutes accurately Berhane, B E R H A N E. and then the last name Haile h a i l e got it madam clerk yes thank you uh, well, the next pick i have is mr sutton Give you a name and address to the clerk for our record, please, sir. Kenneth Sutton, 34 5 Edwards Road, Wing It, North Carolina. Uh, <clears throat> well, we seem to have run on a 
<clears throat> several occasions here with this situation. Uh, for one thing, I don't know, from what I understand right now, all gaming commissions is legal in North Carolina right now until they have a vote on it. And we, when we went before when we was up here, we was here for the district change, or whatever you want to call it, whatever it is, rezoning, I get, I get out in that. <coughs> and they kept bringing that, the, the, the gambling part of it. Well, it had nothing to do with the gambling. I mean, it, it, it had the, diff the difference in the district rezone. And it seems like for some reason, just like they was talking about the other place beside of us there, is uh, when we opened up, he was running the place, but it was a it was a bid. It wasn't games. It was a, a, a ready bid. You go on the computer. You bid on stuff. You bid on stuff. You bid on stuff. You bid on stuff. Which is completely different. So when, when we opened up, we was legal then. But now they saying he's the one that's legal. Even though he wasn't even running the games in. He was running something else. And, you know, it's, it's getting kind of irritating that all of us because of that. And it's, it's, I know there's a lot of definitions to, to the gaming part of it or whichever, but they, I think there was seven more of them around here in the last while. 30 seconds. That got the same, basically the same set. And uh, one of them, uh, which they was running illegal, I mean, everybody knew that, but they finally moved, but they moved from one road to the trail and right back up. So, you know, uh, we would just like, like to really, you know, I mean, we do a lot of good over there. Time's up. You want to wrap it up? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm give sorry. I didn't understand what I didn't hear. But you're fine. I'm going to give everybody the same opportunity. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, that. sir. Thank you. Uh, I have someone signed up from 126 Bay Street. Yes, sir. You will give us your name and address for the record, please. Charles Cuff, 126 Bay Street. I don't know the legal aspects of all of this, but I help clean that parking lot sometime. I keep the... I mean, I come in there on Friday, I, they feed me. It's hard for me to find a job. I found work from people that comes to this establishment, side work or whatever, you know. And it, like I said, the, the establishment next door, you can't even go in there and use the bathroom unless you're playing. You can come in this establishment and use the bathroom. Like you said, you don't have to be playing. You can come and eat on Friday with everybody. You know, it's just, it, it helps me, so. Basically, that's it. I, I need them. It's like my family. So that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> uh, Mr. Blunt at 3405 Edwards Road. Michael Blunt. Uh, okay, Michael, yes, sir. Um, all I got to say is they're real good people. They like, like they say, they feed everybody on Fridays, they take good care of the, our surroundings. They keep the drunks away, and I mean, they look out to everybody, take care of everybody, and that's all I got to say. Very good. Thank right. you very much. Looks like Kim Bolden Monroe. You can give me an address, please, for the clerk record, Kim Bolden. 408 Compasson Street, Compasson. Well, I just about... Like they say, I, I just love them. They are, they are special. They are special people, and they're always there for you, no matter what. Even when you need a, 
you know, somebody listen to. You, say, you know, you need for somebody to listen to you, and like they say, they feed you. You eat all you want. They don't care, you know, who you are, and they don't judge nobody, and I just, they are the best. I mean, and uh, like I said, they always there for you. I just really, I really, I'm very fond of them. I'm very fond of them. Thank I'm you very funny. much. Yes, and like I said, they, they run a very nice place and keep it very clean. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Angela Wright Monroe. <coughs> we'll give you a address, please, Mr. Clerk. 511 Lomax Street. Um, my name is Angela. I do live right up the street from Casey's. I visit that strip mall on a regular. I go to the store at the end of the uh, strip mall. Um, as you've heard from every, you know, everyone before me, we're all just a big family. We ha we we see each other every day. It's basically instead of being on the phone, you can sit there and actually speak to somebody that you haven't talked to in like a week's time. I mean, you know, it's it's a nice change of pace. You can sit back, relax, talk to your friends, eat some food, and you have not a soul to come in there and bother you. They're great people. They take care of everybody that comes in there. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Debbie Monroe. Yes, please. We give you a full name and address to the lady for the record, please. It's Debbie Espinoza, 612 D Street, Monroe, North Carolina. Um, I've been working with these people now for on and off about going on seven years. They're wonderful people, good-hearted people. They take care of their customers. Like they said, we're all family. Um, like they said, they we feed people every Friday night. Uh, we have customers come in just to sit and relax, talk to each other, and have a good time. Uh, without any anyone coming in to bother them, but um, you'll never find any better people to talk to or just be there for you. And that's that's it. Thank you. Thank I have you. a question of you, please. You've been working for them seven years, um, on and off. Well, well not, they've been when this not for. I mean, it was at a, the other establishment. What kind of establishment was that? Um, it. It was that actually the one next door that was grandfathered. I worked there. Oh, but but what yeah. for them though? I've been there for here since they opened. Yeah. So you haven't worked for them seven years. No, but I've known them seven years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank next. You. Thank you. Next, I have Linda Wright, seventeen oh five Sickery Shortcut. You got that, Madam Clerk? Linda Ray, finally 1705 Secret Shortcut, and I've been there about 30 years. I've never had any problem with these people since they've opened up their business. They're always there, and it's a place to go and relax. And I like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Laney Barnes. You give your address and stuff to the clerk, please. Lane Barnes, 2016 B Lex Lot Drive here in Monroe, North Carolina. Well, I've been working there since a couple of weeks after they opened. And I'm 44 years old, and that's the best job I've ever had. And they are, they are I'm sure you heard that enough, but they are wonderful people. I had just lost my grandfather when I started working there. And Mr. Ken is like my second grandfather. So <laughs> I, 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 I just don't want to have to leave them at all. And I don't want them to leave us. They are the best employees I've ever seen. Thank you very much. Uh, Samuel Barnes, Walk Up Avenue. That's 1305 Walk Up Avenue. Uh, okay, Mr. Barnes, not present. Okay, we'll go down to Kevin Barnes, 1305 Walk Up Avenue. Not here. They're not in the other room by chance, are they? Are they anybody in the other room? Well, uh, they, they can hear. They should all be here, Mayor. I... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, we're going down to Eddie Hargett, uh, who will speak in opposition. No, let me, let me skip that and go to this next one. Come back to the Eddie. Uh, Johnson on Fogler Drive. 
Tina. It looks like Tina. Is that correct, ma'am? Uh, she, she would give you a name and address to the clerk, please. Tina Johnson, 907 Folger Drive, Monroe, 112. I've been working at this location and for a year and a half since it opened. And I came from the one next door. Um, the atmosphere in this place, that is a lot of the reason why people come. Because it doesn't matter who you are or anything. You can get along with your neighbor that's sitting beside of you, sit there and have a conversation and not worry about what are they going to do to me. You know, everybody's there to get along. Our elderly people come in. They're not afraid because everybody gets along. They come, our elderly people come because this is a safe place to come and be around other people instead of locked in their homes in their four walls. You know, it's a loving family. Everybody that comes, if y'all would come, you would see how everybody actually cares about each other. Thank you. If I can ask you a question. You left the, the, the establishment store and you went to work. Why did you change? I changed because of the management. Okay. But it's two different type of establishments. Um, the one that was next door to the GMS was Ready Bids. Was what? At the times it used to be a sweepstakes place, mm -hmm. and then it went to uh, Ready Bids, where you would bid on uh, merchandise, gift cards, and stuff like that. As opposed to? As opposed to that one at the time before it went to the Ready Bids was a sweepstakes place. But as opposed to the one that you're working now? The one now is a skill-based arcade game. Okay. Thank you. So it is it's a lot different. Thank you. Thank you. I have one signed up in op to speak in opposition. Uh, Eddie Hargett, 1615. Okay, Mr. Uh, 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 1615 Secret Shortcut, is that correct? Yes, sir. You got that? Eddie Hargett, 1615 Secret Shortcut. Okay. Uh, now, I'm not in opposition. I, I really don't have a dog in this fight. I'm probably the closest neighbor to it. Uh, like I say I've, I've been there 68 years. I don't I don't play the games, and uh, I I see I sit there every day for since they've opened. I've never seen no trouble down there. You know, no police cars in and out. You know, and uh, as far as I don't know if they're legal or illegal. If they if they're legal, they should let them go for illegal. I don't think it should be done by zoning. I mean, you know, and like I say, they keep the, the parking lots cleaned up. Uh, and I think there's more problems in that neighborhood that need to be addressed more so than this. And, uh, that's about it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, which one of the attorneys you want to go This time I'll recognize the attorney, Mr. Green. Travis Green again. Um, I'm going to be brief. I think it's clear that uh, Mr. Kitchens and I would, would probably disagree on this for, for eternity. My point, or most important point in this, is what we are asking you to do is permit an electronic gaming operation under your zoning, which absolutely specifies that it be uh, that it follows state and federal law. So if it violates state and federal law, then we can't do it anyway, even if you do approve the zoning. And if, if, if the, the city, the police department, if they decide down the road or tomorrow for that matter that it violates the law, they'll shut it down regardless of this zoning. All we're asking you to do is give them the opportunity to not be violating the zoning to operate an electronic gaming operation. Um, I think we've, we've attempted to show that, that, that it's a benefit to the community. Um, and really, that's all I have, unless you have some. Any questions for Mr. Gray? Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Kitchen, attorney, we have recognized you again this time, <clears throat> sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be also be very brief. Um, the question is whether or not a rezoning should be permitted. The question is not. Are these good people? 
We're not saying these are not good people that own this establishment. The question is not do people or some people like to play slot machines. Look at Las Vegas. A lot of people out there play slot machines. Apparently they like to do it. They like to lose their money. I will submit to you, however, it is not in the public interest to have gaming establishments that violate both state law and your zoning ordinance. No matter how good the people are, no matter how clean they keep the place up, it is not good public policy to allow businesses like this to exist. You have recognized that they can exist in certain respects if they comply with state and federal law, but they have to be separated. They have to be away from residential single-family houses. This establishment is neither. And I will submit to you, Mr. Mayor, and to the council that they do not currently meet the zoning and I will submit if you were to allow the rezoning, they would still be in violation because it's an illegal gaming establishment under state law and potentially under federal law from what I've heard tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you may have make a comment? If he has anything final, it's these pages. Can you have to make a comment, man? Uh, yeah, give me one second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Green, you have anything final? Nothing. Okay. Mr. Luke. Yeah. Okay. You know, a lot of people here tonight, and we appreciate you coming out, voicing your opinion. And, you know, we on the council want you to know we hear what you're saying, and we commend the owners on, on the things that they're doing in the community. Uh, we understand that it's a good place to be, and you find your friends staying is safe, keeping the parking lot clean, all of those are pluses. But understand whatever we decide is not personal, and we are bound by state law, we're bound by zoning ordinances. And even though our heart may go out to you, we still have to do what is legal. So understand that, because you may be very disappointed. But we want you to know that it is not a personal thing. I'm done. Is anyone else who would like to speak in favor before I close the public hearing? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition? If not, this time I will close the public hearing. I'm sorry. Yes, come to the podium, please. Your name and address, please, for the record. Yes, Colleen Massey, um, 1019 Fletcher Broom Road, Monroe, North Carolina. Um, tonight I hear the gentleman here speaking of slot machines. My definition of a slot machine that I know of, you put coins into it and you pull down a handle. What we have here are not slot machines, just like a computer. And you know what? It really relaxes, you know, relaxes me after working all, all day. And it's just, it's just sounded like it's a disgusting place like slot machines, like a, um, um, uh, what did you call it, Vegas, in Vegas there? A casino, that's what I'm talking about. But it's not a slot machine. And we really enjoy it if you can find it in your heart. I mean, I know you have to do rezoning or whatever. Forgive me, I'm nervous. Sure. <laughs> but um, there's, like they say, there's never been any trouble there, no fighting, no killing, no nothing. And we just enjoy, my husband and I go, honestly, every day, twice a day or more. <laughs> we win some, we lose some. Um, but it is not a slot machine. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else before well, I close the public hearing? Mr. Kitchen, do you have anything else, sir? Okay, very good. All right, this time we'll close the public here. I'm Green. sorry. Ask Mr. Green if he has any. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Green? This time I'll close the public here and we'll take action. Council, questions, comments? Um, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Legally, we, we don't, we, I, from what I'm hearing, what the legal definition is, 
Even though I hear all of these good things, it sounds like legally we have no choice. I will defer to counsel on this judgment in that regard. What I would say is you have two questions you have to decide as to whether or not you would approve the conditional district rezoning. You've heard arguments on both sides as to why you should and shouldn't. And then depending on what you do, you have a resolution of consistency then to deal with as well. So um, it would be up to counsel to make the determination because this is a purely legislative action on your part and it would be based on what you've heard today. But I, I think you've heard, as you've pointed out, you've heard a lot of things from folks in the community. You've also heard legal arguments from both sides on this issue. What is the, what again, was the recommendation of the plan board? Plan, the planning board's recommendation was denial. <clears throat> what, was the rec what is the recommendation of our city staff and our city attorney? Mayor and Council, it's not appropriate for me to provide a recommendation. I would note that the Planning Board has made a recommendation. Well, okay, if you can't make a recommendation, what is, what is the recommendation of our planning staff? No. Okay. So we have a recommendation before us to deny um, this uh, from our Planning Board who have studied it and from our staff who have studied it. Um, I would uh, uh, make a motion that we uh, follow the recommendation of our plan board and our city staff. Second. I have a motion to have a second. Yes, second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? You're not all in favor? Uh, uh, any opposed? And then, uh, Mayor, you would need a re to adopt the resolution of... I make a motion we adopt the resolution. Lifestyle. Okay, I have a motion to adopt the resolution. I have a second. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. That, that is passed the unanimous. Okay. We'll go to item 20. Zoning map amendment request for rezone property at 2751 Old Charlotte Highway. And this is a public hearing. <coughs> Okay, item 20, zoning map amendment request to rezone property located 2751 Old Charlotte Highway, and this is a public hearing. Thank you for asking me for recommendation. I think it's I don't want. I don't want those well, unduly influence. Although I can point the number of times council has not agreed with me. I understand. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's twenty one, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight I'm presenting Zone Map Amendment Request filed by David Privet for the property located at 2751 Old Charlotte Highway. The applicant is requesting the conditional district rezone in order to have the ability to grind wood products to manufacture mulch in conjunction with his landscape site materials business. <coughs> the property is located on Old Charlotte Highway, South Line Blue, near the um, intersection of Carroll Street. <coughs> Properties on GB General Business. Um, the property is located to the east or residential, and properties located to the west or residential R20 as well, and to the 
uh, north and to the east is GB General Business. This is site plan of the property. Um, as stated, the applicant requests a conditional district in order to have the ability to grind wood products to manufa manufacture mulch in conjunction with its site materials business. The applicant is requesting to retain all uses allowed in the GB district as well. The site is currently improved with a 3,750 square foot metal building, and the applicant um, is not proposing any changes, even though he has done some changes since he's occupied the building, but there are no additional structures are being proposed for construction at this time. Show you some pictures. This is a picture of the of the grinder that the applicant is requesting to be able to continue to use to grind mulch on the site. <coughs> this is another picture as well. The applicant has been operating the business for um, probably for over a year now, and um, and is requesting to have the ability to continue to, to operate the, the grinder, build and manufacture mulch on the site, and like I said, in conjunction with being able to sell mulch on site as well. Um, within your packet, also there is a layer that was submitted um, for support for the project that was um, submitted last week. That was put within your packets. This was presented at the plan board um, at last month's meeting. The plan board did recommend approval with the following conditions. Um, one, the grind activity, which does not include maintenance, cleaning, or warming up, or cool down of the grinder, will be limited to operations from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. Two, the grinder shall be located along the rear of the property, not more than 150 feet from the railroad tracks. And three, Mulch shall be stored in wind rows at all times. And the wind rows, and the applicant has um, turned will speak to that, the wind rows are just elongated piles of the mulch um, to keep it where they can keep more, more aired out and not build up heat. And then four, the grinder shall not be operated for any reason, including maintenance and cleaning on Saturdays and Sundays. And instead, this was presented at the planning board last month and they did recommend approval. There's a resolution of land development compliance for approval and disapproval in your packets for your consideration tonight. The applicant's attorney is here to speak on behalf of him, and I'll be answering, glad to answer any questions at this time if you have any. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, sir. Can you give me a name and address to our clerk, please? Certainly. Good evening. My name is Stephen Bennett. I'm an attorney here in Monroe at 314 North Haines Street. Um, this is David Privet. He's the owner of Privet Enterprises, Inc. I'll go ahead and give his address. So. I actually live in Indian Trail 5708 Old Charlotte Highway, but I own the property uh, there 2751 Old Charlotte Highway. And this is obviously Mr. Privet's application for a conditional uh, zoning district there at 2751. I'll let him tell you a little bit about Privet Enterprises, and where he came from, and how he got here. Okay. So, uh, and I'm David Privet. I'm here representing Privet Enterprises, and I appreciate y'all having me. Um, but uh, to, to go back from kind of day one, how I got here, how the business originated, started the business with a firewood business uh, back in uh, 94, 95. Been, uh, you know, in business in the Matt, well, was born and raised in Matthews, I want to say that. I'm a local to the area. Uh, lived, lived in Indian Trail since 1999. But I uh, started the business with a lot of hard work and uh, determination to get to where I am now. But literally started with firewood, uh, kind of grew into service work, grading, clearing, hauling. Um, eventually ended up getting into screening and uh, in the past five, six years, the grinding and uh, manufacturing mulch products and sale of mulch products. We've got two businesses, uh, which Stephen will show you here in a moment. Uh, we've also got Visions Landscape and Design, which is in Monroe as well, off of Rocky River, uh, 2411 North Rocky River Road. It's a retail yard uh, where we uh, sell a lot of what we produce uh, and a variety of other landscape materials. But so I've been in, the, in business in the Monroe area or Monroe, town of Monroe, uh, since 
say end of 14, early, actually 12 is when we opened up, 2012 is when we opened up Visions. Um, moved into the property that's in question, uh, spring of 15. All right. And the property we're talking about is, of course, 2751 Old Charlotte Highway. Um, David purchased it in December of 2014, started operating in early 2015. That's essentially their wholesale location. Um, you can't really go there as a retail consumer and take your truck there and pick up mulch. That's what Visions is for on, on Rocky River Road. Um, this is the location. This is similar to what Mr. Mr. Britt put up earlier. I want to point out that David actually owns that larger parcel to the I guess north, for lack of a better description, um, which is a 12-acre parcel, also zoned general business. He uses that for storage of mulch products, which is what the prior owner also did as well. Under the general business classification, he can store mulch and dirt products um, by right, essentially. So, uh, in that adjacent parcel, that's actually not part of this application. We don't want that rezone. That's going to stay as general business. We were only asking for a conditional rezoning of that. It's a five-acre parcel that's outlined in yellow there. All right. This is what the site looked like before David bought it. This is the. Uh, the prior owner, actually the last two owners, have run a similar business to David on that property. And this is what it looks like today. Started making improvements as soon as he bought it. This is an aerial picture that we took last week with, with their drone. And I want to point out he's put a bunch of shrubs and trees there at the front to help screen um, the business from the road and from folks across the street. He's also put those large concrete retaining walls, one of which is actually double layered, so it's got a planting box. It extends essentially all the way along it, along it, and he's planted trees on top of that. It will eventually be 40 or 50 feet high and further screen the site from everyone, basically. <coughs> um, I do want to point out that I think I mentioned that the two prior owners operated a similar business. The, the first owner, the Arnold Helms family, they actually ground mulch products, which is what David wants to do. Kind of the intervening owner didn't, so we couldn't grandfather this in, which is why we're asking for the rezoning. But it's not. Um, a use that has never been there before. All right, and I want to give you a little background on when he bought this. <clears throat> he thought he bought land that was owned for an industrial use. Um, the appraisal that he received, as well as the work permit, indicated it was zoned industrial, which is what he wanted because he wanted to grind mulch. We know that's an industrial use under the zoning ordinance. Um, and we thought everything was going well until this year, uh, summer of 2017, when Mr. Privet received a zoning violation letter. And surprise, there was an error in the computer system, and the property was actually zoned general business, um, which was a pretty big surprise. Very big so, surprise. And so what we're doing now is we're seeking a conditional rezoning to allow just grinding. Um, he does not want a straight rezone. We're not asking for this to be zoned industrial, that any industrial use could happen there. This is just <clears throat> to allow for grinding. So Mr. Britt pointed out, this is a picture of the grinder. Um, this also came before the planning board and I guess before Thanksgiving. It was a six to, six to two vote uh, for approval. They did have additional conditions, which Mr. Privet happily agreed to. Uh, grinding activity would be limited to 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, never on the weekend. Uh, the grinder would be located along the rear of the property, not more than 150 feet from the railroad tracks. And that actually puts it about 600 feet from Old Charlotte Highway and the residences are obviously across the street from that. So it's a long way away from everyone. Um, all mulch will be stored in windrows. I've got a picture of what that is a little later so you can see what that is and what that means. Um, all right, this is a copy of the zoning map. And you'll see that uh, Mr. Brooks showed you basically above and below. Basically, uh, on David's side of the old Charlotte Highway, it's already zoned general business. And a little bit on the other side. As you zoom out, um, it's not a very good picture on the screen, but down at the bottom, there's some light purple, and what, that's actually light industrial. And, and my point in showing this is that old Charlotte Highway is Surprise, Mr. Mr. Britt didn't see, say his favorite word, which is a, it's a hodgepodge of uses. Um, there's everything on Old Charlotte Highway. It is not a residential corridor. There is a lot of business. There's a concrete plant just 3,000 feet down the road from him. There's a quarry on the other way um, up from him. So there's a variety of uses there. 
right. This is the site plan. Uh, this was performed by uh, Clint Lawrence. I've actually got him here. If you guys have any particular questions about the site plan itself or particular you know, distances, but what essentially it shows is David's property is about 712 feet from essentially the back to the to the road. Um, and he's going to have to locate that grinder with 150 feet of those railroad tracks, so it's a long way away. And the reason I want to mention that is that in this state, we have one regulatory body that deals with mulch facilities, and they require a 200-foot setback, okay? Uh, and that's for everything. We don't have specific regulations regarding schools or daycare centers or churches. Uh, South Carolina does, and it's the same as their residential, which is 200 feet. So in this state, it's 200 feet from everything. David's going to be 600 feet. All right. There are some economic benefits that I want to point out for private enterprises. Um, first of all, he employs 22 people at his two locations, uh, 10 of which actually live here in Monroe with their families. Uh, everybody that works for him lives here in Union County. His total payroll is $1.1 million a year. Um, I think if you do the math, those aren't just jobs, those are really good jobs that Privet Enterprises creates. Um, it's locally owned, the money's staying here in town, in the county. Um, he's made significant community investments aside from just philanthropic um, endeavors. He actually <coughs> spent a lot of money to improve this property. I think you've seen in those pictures. Um, he's done a lot on the appearance of the building, of the property itself. Uh, it basically looks as good as any business in this field can look, frankly. Um, he spent $700,000 on this grinder that he's wanting to operate. He spent $75,000 on a water truck just to keep things clean, knock down the dust. Um, what this is, is it's, it's a successful business that's reinvesting to become better and just bringing increasing tax revenue, jobs for residents. This is the kind of business we talk about wanting in Monroe, and this is, this is what you've got here. All right, now the question you have tonight is does this project actually comply with the land development plan? And we think it does. I think it meets the goals and objectives. For one, it's an environmentally conscious <coughs> business. It literally is recycling organic material from the earth. It can't really get more environmentally conscious than that. Um, it's managing growth and reasonably limits the uses. Those planning board conditions, they're, they're not operating 24-7. You know, it's a very limited window of time they can operate um, in a very limited location on the property. It's not out of character with the surrounding properties. I mentioned before, there's concrete plan, the quarry, there's business uses up and down Old Charlotte Highway. Um, it's a well-planned quality development. I've already kind of touched on that and the buffering and screening he's got. Don't need to improve the infrastructure. And there's uh, what we would contend is minimal offsite impacts. And that is the key question in this, is what impact does the grinder actually have? Um, because I think many of the complaints we've gotten or, or the folks that have come in opposition of this are, are more attuned to what David does as a storage facility. And that's not the question tonight. The question is, what does the grinder do in terms of noise, odor, light, dust? And I don't think it's very much. If anything, and certainly if there is any impact, David has addressed it and, and met it head on. Um, and he's going to tell you about that in a little bit. As I mentioned, we've had a neighborhood meeting. We've sent out letters. And the concerns that we've received are, have been in regards to noise, smell, and dust, kind of the three topics there. Um, as I mentioned before, I think those are more kind of a misunderstanding about what this application is really about. This is just grinding only. Um, and we're going we're gonna to address those. So noise. I don't think Privet Enterprises produces a level of noise dissimilar from anything else that could be in a general business zoning district. Now, the operation of the mulch grinder is going to be in a manner that doesn't increase noise for the neighbors. And I want to mention the key question, of course, is what is the noise that the grinder introduces? And I've heard kind of two components of that. The first <coughs> component is, is truck traffic. That's the first concern. And noise from truck traffic is remaining the same. It's not an expansion. It's a limited amount of grinding. Um, it's a continuation, really, of what they've been doing since they've been in business. Um, I would point out that this is a general business use, and any general business use of this property is going to have truck traffic. I mean, a general business use could be a gas station. That's going to have plenty of truck traffic in and out. Um, grinding on site, frankly, is actually the best for reducing traffic because the alternative is that he has to put his grinder on another piece of property and then truck it in to store it on the property. Um, second component of noise is the grinder itself. 
Now, as we've mentioned, it has to be located 150 feet from those railroad tracks. Um, and it's actually not run very much. Uh, David can actually tell you exactly how many hours it's been run, but I think it's only about 200 hours this year on the site itself, which is going to average out to around four to five a week. Um, and David also had, we did a sound test with a decibel meter out there. and let him tell you a little bit about that and what our findings were. Yes, so folks, when all this come up, then I wanted to uh, kind of, you know, just prepare myself and kind of further educate myself and what uh, noise could be uh, leaving from the grinder uh, in our operation there. Um, uh, the grinder itself, you know, as Stephen had mentioned, we're against railroad tracks. A train produces anywhere from 125 to 140 dB, which is a decibel reading. Uh, this grinder is Doug Britt's been to the property. Him and I have stood right beside the grinder at full throttle. It produces an 85 dB. Uh, as you start uh, to work away in distance from the grinder, then that dB starts to fall, a decibel reading. Uh, coincidentally enough, uh, a leaf blower produces 75 dB at 50 foot away. This grinder produces 72 dB at 125 foot away. As you get back out into my parking lot, 600 foot away from the grinder, we're at 51, 52 dB. So uh, pertaining to noise, there's no noise that uh, is, is going to produce uh, a decibel level that's going to be offensive to anybody around it. Coincidentally, as you get closer to Old Charlotte Highway, uh, and these are all decibel readings that anybody can pull up on the internet and look, look at and see for themselves, but as you get closer to Old Charlotte, Old Charlotte Highway, you pick up I said anywhere from a 70 to 85 dB, which is produced by a constant flow of trucks, traffic, and uh, uh, you know vehicles going up and down a major thoroughfare between Charlotte and Monroe. So we're literally sandwiched in between <coughs> two uh, noise-producing uh, components that are make way more noise than what that grinder makes when we're talking about grinding. Um, like I said, as, as far as DB levels, we're, uh, we're, we're well below with the grinder running. Doug Britt's been at the property with Stephen and myself. And uh, with it running, we had to go back to the back of the property on a golf cart to make sure that one of my employees had the, the machine on and revved up. And as we sat with Doug Britt uh, and my employee at the machine, we made sure we throttled it all the way down and throttled it all the way back up and we went back up to the front of my business and uh, there weren't any decibel levels that again exceeded 52 dB until you got up closer to Old Charlotte Highway and you got back into what I just explained. And if you're curious, 52 is about the normal decibel rating from a normal conversation. So that, to give you some perspective on what that means. Second, I guess, complaint that we've received is regards to smell. Now, I wanna point out the physical grinding of mulch doesn't produce a smell other than just cut wood. The grinder doesn't produce a foul smell. Um, now, Privet Enterprises has encountered issues with smell in the past, but those have been due to mulch storage. And that is something that has been an evolving process and something that David has worked tirelessly at in overcoming. And I'm gonna let him explain that a little bit more. Can you pull that picture up? Yes. Okay. So what Stephen's got up there now uh, are examples of, of how we currently have mulch stored on the property. Uh, that would be what you would call a windrow. Uh, what got us into trouble with uh, a handful of fires that were on the property, and particularly a smell, uh, was prior to um, kind of going through that experience when they were performing the grinding work or clearing work on Monroe Bypass, I personally made the mistake, uh, the material was available of taking in too much mulch off of the Monroe Bypass. And our, our first nature was to store it in a big pile. Well, the problem with that is as you store material on the bottom and you take material in behind it and you store on top of it, that material on the bottom and as it's layered, it starts to produce a heat. Uh, when you've got it in a mass pile, there's no way to get down to that bottom layer uh, and, and turn that material to eliminate the heat, and the heat and the smell kind of go hand in hand. Um, so what we did after going through those problems, and uh, myself and several employees 
spent countless hours, holidays, weekends, weeknights, uh, two, three o'clock in the morning, whatever the case might be, uh, down monitoring these piles. So what we've done now is we put everything in windrows. The reason we do that is because we can go out and walk these windrows with a thermometer. We probe the thermometer um, to regulate the temperature. If we see the temperatures rising in these mulch piles, then we, need, we know that we need to schedule to turn the mulch piles. Uh, it's a pretty simple solution to making smell and fire go away, and that is you keep the heat out of the mulch. So uh, twice a week we go out, I've got a five foot tall temperature probe, we go out and we probe these piles. We, we monitor uh, what we find. If we see we're getting a temperature anywhere above 120 degrees, we know we need to start making plans on turning piles. So that's what we do. We've got excavators that we can put on these piles. Uh, the company owns four of them. One of them can get back there and adequately turn those piles in a day if need be. Um, but we go in, we turn the piles. Simply turning the pile releases the heat. You can tear the pile down, let the heat release, and the pile can be stored back into a windrow. But that's common practice for anybody that would store uh, wood chips uh, in, in mass quantity. Um, and, and just what we do to regulate heat, regulate temperature. Again, temperature and smell go hand in hand. It's like the old saying, if you see smoke, there's fire. Well, if you smell a smell, you potentially got fire coming. I've become an expert at how to prevent uh, this from being a problem, not only for myself, my employees, countless overtime hours, but also most importantly, my neighbors, for it not to be a problem with them. And we've had, we've had mulch on the property now uh, for five months. Um, stored in this fashion, hadn't had one single problem. I'm there every day. I've got employees that are there every day. They understand absolutely 100% what they need to do. If I'm out of town, not available, whatever, somebody used to go back and uh, test the temperature ratings. We've got a wind sock that we've put up to, to uh, identify favorable wind conditions. We make plans on turning the piles, releasing the heat, getting rid of the smell. And one important thing to point out is he does want to sell the stuff in those piles. It's obviously in his best interest not to let fire or smell happen because he can't sell it anymore. Uh, all right, the last major complaint that we've heard about is, is dust. And I think the major sources of dust out at that site are truck traffic into and out of the site and, and basically dust from the wind's interactions with piles of dirt and mulch. Um, now, to combat any dust from the grinder itself, there's a dust suppression system on the grinder which actually uses water lines to essentially knock down the dust before it ever escapes it. Um, as we mentioned before, the grinding activity is to be located 150 feet from the railroad tracks. It's, I'm going to show you a picture. The grinder is going to be located behind these other piles of stuff to further prohibit um, any dust from going anywhere. Um, he's also mentioned that wind sock, and that's useful because he's only going to want to grind in favorable wind conditions. We don't want to make the neighbors mad. Um, and finally, I mentioned that he does have a, a water truck. He sprays down the parking lot, sprays down the area to make sure it's not dusty. Um, you know, I've heard a story about Arnold Helms when they were running it. it. Folks didn't even know there was pavement at that facility. There was so much dust. There's been the same pavement's been there for years. It's just that now you can see it because David keeps it in, in, in shape out there. Um, one thing I do want to mention, it, it, at the planning board, there was a medical study kind of disseminated about supposed dangers of wood dust from a mulch facility. Um, and what that really was, they did a, and, and you folks are, you're looking at me like I'm crazy, but you're going to get this in a little bit. I want at least to comment on it. Um, what that was was a case study of a mulch facility up in Maryland that they were having trouble with. And the main point <clears throat> that I think needs to be made is that study mentioned that a 500 foot buffer in almost every single instance is perfect. There's no issues with dangers of wood dust, if there are any, which I don't think there are, <coughs> but a 500 foot buffer takes care of all of that. There was a problem with a place up in Maryland that was producing an untold amount. Um, it was compared to facilities producing hundreds of thousands of yards of mulch. David produces a fifth of that. But the issue is it was located on top of a 100 foot tall hill around the sur surrounding neighborhood. And so that made a difference in how far wind blew dust. Dave is not on a hill. It, it's a completely, completely um, different scenario here.
facade. This is the picture of that grinder. I think you've actually seen that maybe from Doug, but this is a set, one of the locations it could be in behind those piles. Um, so I'm going to say this in conclusion. I, I think this, this proposal, it's a limited proposal. This is, it's not asking for a straight rezoning. This is just one condition that you can grind in a limited amount of time in a limited area. Um, and I think it's consistent with the land development plan. I think it addresses the concerns of the community, um, which I think are going to be mainly attuned to the storage function of this, which isn't up for debate tonight. Um, I think the proposal is limited in scope. It's reasonable in nature. And I would like to point out, David's a good business, and there are a lot of economic benefits for this. And we certainly hope that you approve it. If I could, we'd like to re reserve a few minutes at the end just to address any issues that may come up. Yeah, sure. And, and obviously, if you have any questions. You, one thing you didn't mention, this is seasonal too, isn't it? Say that again, sir? Seasonal? Yes, ma'am. It is. Uh, and one thing I wanted to mention, since we had our planning and zoning meeting, we also use this grinder to, uh, uh, when if somebody goes in to clear a track of land for a home site, new business, whatever, we also use that to grind that way. It's just a fully recyclable a uh, piece of equipment, we turn everything that it produces back into a landscape product all the way down to the stumps uh, that, that we can grind and turn every bit of that back into a, a soil or mulch product. Uh, but coincidentally, the machine left um, after we had that planning and zoning meeting and it won't be back for over a month. Uh, it's not like there's been comments, well, they want to get this approved because they want to grind material, they're going to go hog wild and they're going to grind material up day and night and this and that, and that's not the case. Um, our biggest season for mulch and mulch sales is spring of the year. You all may know that from when you do work in your own yards. Um, so, you know, uh, that what the, what the machine will produce is about 300 yards an hour. We sell about 15 to 20 yards is a given uh, when somebody calls our place of business to place an order for material. Um, so at 300 yards an hour, and you can kind of get the gist of that, if you run it for five or six hours, how long it would take you to sell that material. We don't have enough room on the property to store more than what we need to sell, and we don't have enough room there to store more finished material than, than what we need to kind of prepare ourselves moving forward uh, for uh, you know, spring of the year coming or, or what we need on a daily basis there to have provided for our, our customers. But... Uh, so, Lydia, you're exactly right. It's uh, it's it's a, a very seasonal. Uh, there's not many mulch sales at all in the summer. It's more of a spring time of year. We do run the machine throughout the year, but our hottest time would be uh, spring of the year. Um, is, is when we sell the majority of our material. Any other questions? Thank you very much, sir. This is a public hearing, and we have several people signed up, and uh, we'd ask to each to, to, who speaks to limit it at least three minutes. We want to be fair to everybody, so we'll give everybody the same amount of time. Uh, and uh, at this time, we'll start uh, Reverend Steve Hastings. Reverend Steve Hastings, we'll recognize you this time, sir. Uh, I am representing First Assembly of God Christian School and Daycare which is located just diagonally across the street from Privet Enterprises. They referred to a study that was uh, made by Johns Hopkins University and Medical Center, one of the most prestigious and renowned institutions in the United States today, as if that meant nothing and as if it was only based upon one study. But if they had bothered to look at the report, they would have found that it incorporated over 30 different studies from 1980 through 2014 all of which concluded that this did, uh, the wood dust, now when you think of dust, people think that's like dust that's blowing around on the ground. No, wood dust is microscopic particles that gets into the air just like a microorganism, just like a bacteria or any other substance. Uh, Mr. Privet uh, said that uh, they did do some wood grinding back in the summer before when they thought they were in compliance and found out they weren't. During the time that this wood grinding was going on, we had six children in our daycare that were seen by their pediatricians and diagnosed with dermatitis. Now, if you know what dermatitis is, if you've ever been exposed to poison ivy, the rash that breaks out on your arms, your chest, or your legs, that's dermatitis. These children had rashes on their legs, on their arms. 
the uh, physicians determined that they were being exposed to something, but they did not know what. They asked us as the daycare, determine what these kids had in common. Well, they're coming out of different buildings, so that wasn't the common thing. The only common area that they had was the playground. They're on the playground at different times during the day. They're demand it's a state regulation. They have to be out on the playground. So there's nothing we could do about that. At the time, we weren't aware that Privet Enterprises was doing the mulching. If we had been, we could have had the physicians do a test, a simple test, that would have determined whether it was the wood dust that was causing this or not. Uh, interestingly enough, I teach physics and chemistry in our school. We do controlled experiments, and in a controlled experiment using the scientific method, you only have one thing that's different. Well, we actually had a controlled experiment that we didn't really know was going on. The only different element was the wood mulching that was taking place across the street. When this wood mulching stopped, we've had no children. These children, the dermatitis cleared up. We've had no outbreaks from it since then. I've been pastor there for 33 years. We've never had an incident like that until this time. Uh, the report I'd like to read from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention says exposure to wood dust has long been associated with a variety of adverse health effects including dermatitis, allergic respiratory effects, musical and non-allergic uh, respiratory effects, and cancer. The toxicity data in animals are limited particularly with regard to exposure to wood dust alone. There are, however, a large number of studies in humans because so many humans have been exposed to it because of different regulation. Also, if they had referred to the report from John Hopkins. Line it up, if you will, please. Okay, they would have found out that they, were, they say 1,500 feet should be a minimum. Uh, just as one other thing, I did do it, run a uh, thing, and I don't know how to operate this machine here, but I think if you have that, you will see a three-mile area. It says that within the first, sorry, the pink area is the first one square mile area. The orange area is from one to two. The area outside in yellow is from uh, two to three. The pink is a, a, a extreme zone. The orange is a heavy contaminant zone. The yellow is a light contaminant zone. Notice the number of elementary schools that are in that. I'll have to call you on time. I've done give you a uh, good bit of extra time, so I've got to call you on time. Can I just say one more thing, please? If you, if you <laughs> I'll make it short. Please. The total number of students is 3,137. Based upon that, 20%, this report says, will be exposed and have a reaction. That's over 600 students. To me, that's not acceptable. Thank you, sir. May I, may I ask you one question? Yeah, sure. Okay, that illustration you had had that yellow, which was a light contamination zone. Yeah, actually, it's Does moderate. It show, I said light, but it's moderate contamination. Moderate. Does the study show that within the moderate uh, contamination zone, that does it say any exposure to the dust or long exposure to it? It just said that uh, from the report that it had, and, and I based this on the report that, from John Hopkins, there was actually one man who lived 3.1 miles outside of the area. He contracted the uh, uh, bacterial infection from the wood dust, uh, and he died from it. It is a very serious thing. So uh, I would conclude that since, you know, the code says that even though all other provisions might be met in a zoning uh, request, if it could s show a substantial uh, risk to health, that it can still be denied. And I would respectfully ask that you would consider that. Councilor, any other council member have questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> James Vickery is here to speak in opposition. I'll call James at this time. Sir, my name is James Vickery. I live at 2506 Carroll Street. Uh, I live approximately three houses down uh, from Old Charlotte Road. I'm speaking in opposition uh, on behalf of both me, my son, my grandfather-in-law, and my neighbors. Uh, my grandfather-in-law uh, has had a uh, uh, embalming fluid poisoning. Even though there is a dust suppression system, the diesel fumes and the dust and everything, when they were grinding 
they weren't able to come outside. You could smell the diesel fumes. My 10 month old son couldn't come outside. My neighbor who is a Vietnam veteran, uh, severely exposed to Agent Orange due to health concerns, they could not make it tonight because he was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, Any time back in the summer when they were grinding, they were not able to come outside at all any time. Uh, I had breathing problems due to the beginning stage of COPD as being a firefighter. Baker's 19. Uh, yes, I, I know the fires are not relevant to it and everything, the grinding situation. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's a risk to the whole community because, like Reverend Hastings said, that I've pulled up several different studies other than the ones he's pulled up. Uh, they, it, according to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association, the dust contamination, it, it, it's dangerous and toxic to everybody. Even though there is a dust suppression system on them, which I have operated in the past to grind a machine myself because I've done that type of work. Uh, matter of fact, I've approached Mr. Privet back when he first moved in over there about a job because I used to be a heavy equipment operator, so I know how one of these machines operates. Even though there is a dust suppression system, it still dispersed dust no matter what you do to it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna throw dust no matter what, and it, I'm in, in full opposition of it, not only for my health, but my son's health, the neighbor's health, and everybody else, so. Mr. Victory, are you saying it's just the dust from the grinding or the dust from the storage of the mulch? Uh, mainly the dust from the grinding and, uh, I mean, when they turn the mulch over, I mean, you can tell. So, no matter what they do. About, because the, what we're talking about now is the grinding, so yeah. I just want to be clear in my head. So. Any other questions? Council, have any other questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Tommy Collins, 2501 Carroll Street. <coughs> Clark, you getting these addresses as I call them out, or do we need to? Yes, sir. You getting okay? I don't have one. I'll get. Hi, uh, Tommy Collins at 2501 Carroll Street. I'm uh, just about exactly across the street from his operation. Mostly the odor, the smell, the dust. I mean, you can't breathe back back when it was bad. And we're afraid, basically, it's going to get back that way if you pass this. That's the point. If you pass this, from his way of operating already, showing us that he's pretty much going to do what he wants to do. He's already been warned about running it, about per Mr. Britt. They went over there and warned him. He wasn't in zoning. He still did it per Mr. Britt, telling me, he got cited for it. So that goes to show he's going to go ahead and do what he wants to do. Furthermore, if y'all live there, you know what I'm talking about, what we're afraid of it going back to. Right now it is. He's not running it much, so it's not smoking, stinking. Well, it's, it's good. It's good to live there again, even though it's dusty. Like he had mentioned, mentioned up here, the truck traffic causes a lot of dust. He, he had an address fixing that. Turning it over causes some dust, and the like this boy said, when you put it in there, it's going to fly out some of it. Yeah, it will. Uh, there's no way around it. But we feel like he's going to go back to what he wants to do. He's going to enlarge the business. He's got this other land sitting there. I mean, I would if I, had, I was him. I mean, why buy it if you're not going to use it? Uh, but he's not trying to get that zoned yet. He's going to wait on that. Um, he's just not a trustworthy person that I can found out and from personal and what he's told me. Um, we, we live there, and if he wanted a business like that, it should have been out in the country somewhere where it was, wouldn't cause anything. Uh, he has fires, yeah, and he's wind rowing it, but what if he goes back to piling it up 40, 50, 60 foot tall again? What recourse do we have after you pass it? You know, what is, what is our recourse if he runs it from morning to night and even on the weekends? What, what are we going to do then? I mean, you know. Who do we go to? What can we do? Go get lawyers and fight it out? And 
And another thing, I don't know about this, but they showed some kind of a letter. Is that that letter? Could I have a copy of that letter, please? I mean, just to point it up again from whoever it was that was in yeah, favor. Everybody on the council board's got one of them. I mean, show it up again. It was said 2,500. Yeah, 30 seconds, minutes. sir. Mr. Gilbert. I, I didn't 30 think. seconds. And that's the only letter you had in favor of any of the neighbors. Well, we've got a lot of people. Well, we're going to have to hear it. You'll have an opportunity to speak. <laughs> okay, where does this say right here? Uh, I can't. Okay, Wallace, Gil Fallon. You have six Gil. seconds, sir. Sir? Six seconds. Okay, anyhow, I have right here where this same man signed my petition against it. You see that right there? Bubba? You're driving 2500 Carroll Street, so okay. I, I, I'm gonna have to cut you off. I hate to cut you off, but I'm trying to give everybody the same okay. thing. Can we come back later? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Probably Thank not, you. but let's see. The same person signed both. Times. I'm trying to give everybody the same thing. If we don't, we'll all be here till tomorrow. Uh, so let's <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to be fair. Uh, Clint Lawrence, uh, oh no, let me come on down. Wait a minute. I'll come back to Kitty, uh, Miss Kitty Hicks. I'm taking the opposition. I'll come back for one in favor when we get through with these. Uh, Ms. Kitty, three minutes, please. I will try. Um, I, my name is Kitty Hicks, and I reside at uh, 15816 Idlewild Road up in the Hemby Bridge area. <coughs> I'm here not, I mean, I'm aware of all of these residences' um, complaints, and they are real. I happily own property that's across the street from this area. I have rental properties. I have three homes. And I've been, you know, concerned about this because of my tenants that have brought their complaints to me. And um, it was, you know, his petition that I'm really disappointed in the planning board. I suppose you all, I don't know how you get your feedback, but it was not a unanimous decision to pass this on to your board. There were some very concerned uh, members of the party that were not in board and they actually came up with a sort of a compromise I guess you would say that they were going to allow them to grind from 10 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon however Mr. Privet was not too pleased with that because he thought he ought to have an extra hour until 4 o'clock because their consensus was that you know people are away from home during the middle of the day and they're you know they, they're not bothered by the problems why would they be even concerned about the time would they be bothered by problems if there wasn't a problem? And um, so, <clears throat> I've, you know, I know the community because I've had these homes for 18, 20 years, and I don't consider them rental properties. I consider them homes for families that I'm, I'm fortunate enough to provide at a reasonable rate that these people can have nice homes, and this is a very nice area. And um, so, um, I uh, am concerned in addition that my property value because I have that my in, you know my intention is to provide these homes and I have one family that lives there that has two young children and she homeschooled her children so during the 10 to 3 o'clock time of day then they are basically going to probably be incarcerated because this is toxic stuff anybody that has ever gotten to become an adult knows that when you grind something you're going to have some particles and and these particles during the time it's grinding are airborne and they land on the people's cars here there's a one of the red, well i'm sorry but you they had a lot of time to present their case before we came up here to not you know to and some of the things that they um draw your attention to um your um statement of um, purpose that um, is to provide an orderly transition this is not orderly within got about five seconds pardon me about five seconds sir I, and I'm it is to be this fair is to not everybody compatible. give all the same if I give this uh, is not compatible and he stated about the, the uh, other industrial things this this really will then destroy the neighbor and it's a great neighborhood 
I understand. And, uh, and the noise, his grinding noise, he made a statement here that it was not excessive. My houses are in, out by the other church. Yes, I was working one day, and it's a, a, just a horrible noise all day long. And yes, I could hear it very well, oh, and the oh, neighbors right. did too. Well, thank you very much. So, I'm just trying to be fair. Uh, uh, Vicki Collins of Carroll Street. 2501 Carol. Oh, yes, okay. I live right across the street from the place, and I understand what all he's done for the looks of it, all he's done to take care of the place, but he didn't do this until we started having problems. Then he started shaking the place up over there. I don't care how much he does, there's still dust. There's still noise, and we have it to live with. We're right there. My house, inside my house, gets this stuff coming in it. Our deck, the porch out there, every bit of it gets the dust. If there's a fire, we get every bit of that over there, and it comes in the house, and it actually gets into your furniture, into your drapery. We hadn't been living there three years. We were there before he moved in and started out there. We went and put all new furniture in this house, new drapery, it's all been painted, but now it's got all this mess in it. You people live beside this and see how y'all would like it. You walk outside, the dust you gonna breathe, you wash your cars, you park them under your carport. Look at all that when you live there. See if you like to have to look at it every day whenever you walk out your door. I walk out in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, sometime two o'clock, because I get up and go to work at that time of the morning. And you got it to breathe in. The dust is in the air then. You can't get away from it, it's there. And like I said, if he wanted to do this, he already took it back out in the country, or either he should have took it up there on Old Monroe Road where he lived. I don't, he don't know me, I don't think, but I've known him for quite a long time. I know somebody that used to work for him for a few years, and I know him back then. And I, I can name problems, which I won't go into, with the work that was there. But what I'm concerned with right now is what's going on now and we're having to live with, and it's not right. Ma'am, are you concerned with the mulch itself or just the grinding? The mulch, whenever they start doing the mulch and, and moving all this stuff and the dust, it's, it's in the air. I mean, you come up there. If you don't believe it, you come up there and look. I can wash the cars and vehicles and park them out there, and they're absolutely coated. And it You're don't talking about come. the mulch just stored? Whenever they turn that mulch, oh, the grind, oh, the, you oh, know when they turn, turn in that mulch. Okay. You can smell it. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right, uh, Mr. Clint Lawrence, 106 West Jefferson Street, speaking in favor. Mr. Mayor, I'm Clint Lawrence. I worked on the project, so I just signed off in case you guys had questions. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, David Privet. Yes, I'm You're sorry. right, the same one, okay. And uh, is it T U N A L L, Carroll Street, 25. 25 to Carroll Street. Uh, my name is Brian Tunall. I live at 2525 Carroll Street. I'm also speaking for my mother who lives at 2529 Carroll Street. I'm also an employee of Privet Enterprises. I live 12 doors down uh, from the, the shop. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of what we've done there. Um, we've put investments in the community. Uh, so start to finish place looks tenfold better than it used to. As Mr. Privet stated, we did have an issue with the pile. We've corrected that issue. We don't have the smell issues. We don't have the heat. We don't have any fire issues. Um, <clears throat> the grinder that we use is a 2017 model. It's state-of-the-art dust suppression. I mean, th they're fine machines now. Uh, we, we just, we don't have the issues like we had. And like I said, I'm proud of what we've done and I am for this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Andy Johnson, <clears throat> is that 524 Rain Tree Drive? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Andy Johnson, 524 Rain Tree. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. So, uh, I'm a customer of, of David Privet. Uh, my wife and I have had a business in Indian Trail for 18 years. He's also done uh, work at our home. Um, I'm not an expert on mulch. You know, I spread it and. You'll have to deal with that probably every spring, as many of you do. 
Uh, but I am a pretty good judge of, of people and character. And, and what I'm really up here to talk about is uh, from David's standpoint, he's done a lot of work for us. Um, a lot of the activities that he does is a little bit of uh, science and a little bit of art. And it's not perfect to start with. What I've been really impressed about with David is his uh, commitment to his word and his ability to get things right you know, over time. All right, so he's done a number of different projects. Um, his stick to itiveness is attentive to the details. His responsiveness, if we've ever had any concerns or problems, have been outstanding. And you know, one of the hardest things that I have in this day and age is, is finding good people that I can rely on to do good work uh, and consistently stand by it. So from uh, David's standpoint, you know, again, I'm not a mulch expert, uh, but I am a pretty good people expert. And uh, I think he's done an excellent job living up to his commitments for me and the, the activities that asked, I've asked him, uh, him to do. All right. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Very much. Is anyone else who would like to speak in favor? Name and address, sir. It's Scott Deering, uh, 401 Gullage Parker Road in Monroe. Um, yeah, uh, good friend of David's, uh, here to support him grinding from the hours of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday uh, in order to uh, enhance his business. I think a lot of what you've heard out here from some of these people don't pertain to what we're actually here to talk about, which is the <coughs> grinding. The grinding will not add any additional mulch, dust, anything of that nature. I've heard some people talk about it being a carcinogenic. I think the pastor had mentioned that, but the pastor had also asked David to come by there, or asked David if he would donate some mulch to that same church, which he rightfully did. So it's hard for me to understand some of these complaints about, about the odor and the smell and, and some of what we're talking about here. So again, I, it, it's not gonna change anything of what's going on at that property. We're just asking to operate one piece of equipment Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And basically it's not gonna change noise, dust level, the amount of product that's sitting on the property. That's all I got to say. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak in favor? Name and address, sir, when you get to the podium for a clerk. Uh, Jimmy Perry, 3511 Savannah Way, Monroe. Uh, I've known David for going on 20 years. I've been in the landscape industry in Union County for 25 years. Uh, he's been a great vendor. Uh, one of the things that I want to talk about was the mulch. If we talk about mulch in general, uh, if you look on every playground in this county, it's, it's required to have a cypress mulch. So I want to talk about it being a Carson Jink, but it's required, and you have to have it at a certain depth for safety of kids. I, I don't know how it can be something that's, that's uh, going to hurt us when it's required by the government at a certain height and set for softness and, and, and uh, as a safety item for our kids. So that's one of the things I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who would like to speak? Can I speak? I'm sorry? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Name and address, sir, please. My name is Jeff Champion. I work, I live at uh, Indian Trail, and uh, I'm not a speaker, anything like that, but I'm the guy that runs this grinder. I've been working for David going on seven years. I'm the one that runs the grinder. I've been running grinders, doing land clearing for the past 30 years. And I'm trying to get in my mind where all of this toxic, everything is coming from, from a grinder. And if somebody can show me where the sickness is coming from or how they're getting sick, and I'm, I'm at ground zero every day that we run it. I haven't been sick. I can count on one hand the time I've been sick that many in the past 25 years. Knocking on wood. But all this mess about the grinder stinking, all that, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, if you want to talk to somebody about it, talk to me. Okay, thank you, sir. Would it be possible for us to visit? Anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, sir. Name and address, please, for the clerk. My name is Rob Johnson. I live at 2451 Shining Light Church Road. 
Um, I've worked for David for just over a year now, but for a period uh, in the 90s, I worked at Robert O. Helms Company, the previous owner, who happens to be my father-in-law, for about eight years. And I've seen a vast difference, one, in the improvements that David's made to the property, which is quite obvious, but more importantly, the, the way and the manner in which he operates the business. Uh, his integrity is, is incredible, and I've, I've, I've witnessed that firsthand. And if, if he thought for a minute that this grinding was going to cause the problems that's, that's, that's been a, uh, brought up here, he wouldn't do it. And I wouldn't work for him if he did. Um, also, the property that I live on backs up to where this grinder is going to be placed. I, uh, and I have no issues or concerns whatsoever with the grinder being backed up to my property where I live and my family. And I would just uh, really encourage you to vote uh, positively in this manner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Come. David, address, hey, please. I'm all hills. And uh, I sold David the property whenever we shut our business down and everything. And he asked me what all we did there. Yeah, we had a screener. Yeah, we had, we chipped wood. We'd done a little bit of everything that he does. But we just wasn't that big a volume, but we were big in sand. We run out of there 24, six, 24 hours a day. I had trucks run 24 hours a day in and out of that place. Yeah, we had trouble with dust. Yeah, when it gets dry, everybody has trouble. But I think he's doing a very good job and he is fixed the place up unreal compared to what we were. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Could you repeat your name again and address, sir? Because I don't think it's, I, I think when you came up, we couldn't hear it. Up your name and the address dice. again. So please. these people. 2431 Shining Light Church Road. What was your name again, sir? What was your name again, sir? Arnold Hill. Okay, Annie thank you. Yep. Okay. Is anyone else who would like to speak? Anyone who would like to speak in opposition? Uh, well, he's, he's going to drive me. No, no, no you, you've already spoke one time, ma'am. I can't lie. I just forgot to Oh, that'd be no, fine. No, 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 no sir. Oh, no, sir. No, I'm sorry. Um, council under state law, they no, ma'am. I can't take it. No, ma'am. It was not. It was not provided to council. That unfortunately, state law requires it has to be provided to council two business days ahead of time for it to be considered by you. It has not. Therefore, it cannot be provided to you. Very good. Okay. Could I address some of the things that they brought out? No. No, sir. He's already. I'm sorry. About the health issues, and they said they didn't understand how to fix the problem. But no, sir. No, sir. Attorney, attorney, attorney advised me it's not now. Okay. Mr. Bennett, uh, um, that's where sir. Yeah. Uh, would Mr. Time. Bennett like to close this out? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. You said the right thing. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, one thing I did want to point out is is the letter of support in your packet. That is from the neighbor directly across the street from David, and he couldn't be here. His wife has. Uh, and he says it has no effect on her and no effect on him. Um, I do want to point out in regards to the, the health stuff, NC Diener is the only regulatory agency we have in the state and they require a 200 foot setback. David is way beyond that. He is inspected by the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality every single year. He has never had a problem. Um, Interestingly, the North Carolina Department of Child Development does approve mulch for facilities like daycares. It is on the approved list. Um, you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess just to kind of, you, you know, uh, you can try to spin it into whatever it is, but if you hire a tree company to come to your property and take down a dead tree and they chip it in the back of your truck, are you going to get sick? Uh, you know, we're, there's so many examples of this that are around you every day probably mulch outside the front of this establishment out here. Uh, myself and that gentleman that come up here and spoke about grinding, we're around it all the time. My employees are around it all the time. There are kids that come to the retail yard and play in the mulch piles at the retail yard while their parents are making a selection of the material they want. It just, you know, the study 
it talks about kiln dried wood and all these different things that doesn't pertain to what we do. It just doesn't. And we're only talking about, to get back to real quick, the hours we put on that machine. We put 200 hours on that machine in a year's time. I bought a brand new one, $700,000 piece of equipment. The gentleman sitting back here that I bought it from, from Caterpillar Monroe, by all places. Um, $700,000, but when all this come up, I went out and I looked at that machine. I want to see how many hours were on it and how to, how to get this into people's head, get it into people's minds. 300 hours on it. A hundred of those hours had been ran off the, off of my property, off site. 200 hours of it had been put on the machine on my property. If you do the math on the 200 hours in the 11 months, that's 18 hours a month or four hours a week. Four hours a week is what we're talking about. 18 hours a month. And we, somebody got up here and said that we quit running. Little do they know, and that's the other thing about this, I've, we've never quit running it. Yeah, we never quit. And the reason for that is obviously enforcement actions are stayed while this rezoning is pending. Because um, we've, we've been going through this process with uh, meetings and Doug Britt and getting folks out to the property and uh, planning and zoning and now here before you all tonight um, you know so but I was it was explained to me as long as you're going through the process there is a stay in proceedings I've got 20 people to provide for I got to do that I got to run that machine I got to produce a product and I got to support the people to work for me that's what we did in running it during this process. Okay. Just yes. asking for y'all to consider all that. We can't have, have any questions. Uh, just this. So the issue is just about the, the conditional zoning just for the grinding. It's, I know a lot of people are upset just about the mulching, and I don't know if it's clear in everybody's mind what the specific issue is. Um, and some of the things that, that are concerned with general business you can do anyway. I don't know if that's understood or not. It is understood. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just say, Councilman Anthony is correct that if you um, if you approve this with the conditions placed by planning and the planning board, it just allows the additional use of the grinder. If you were to deny it, it allows them to do everything they currently do except use the grinder. That's what you have here. Any questions? Please? Any other questions? Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, sir. Mayor, the only it, that it, you probably want, may want to close it out unless you feel new information was presented that others need to weigh in on, but I don't Thanks, believe sir. that's the case. Okay, just time we'll close the public hearing. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> with the stipulations that the planning board put on uh, Mr. Privet, which is watering down as the chipper runs and wind rowing the mulch and the improvement that's been made since uh, the gentleman took the property over i move we grant the request i have a second i have a motion i have a second right here second, second. oh i have a motion and a second any questions comments you're not all in favor uh, oh, uh, well, well, one thing the watering down is not is not a condition no i'll just, correct. just make sure everybody knows it. i'm sorry as the plan recommended, just to make sure we're on the same page, was that grind activity listed from 10 to 3, Monday through Friday. Um, grind located on the rear property, not more than 150 feet from the railroad tracks. Mulch stored in wind rows, and the grinder should not be operated for any reason on Saturday and Sunday. So he, he keeps the water down as a, I guess, as a business practice, but that was not a condition of the plan board. I just want to make sure that's, that's clear. So that is the condition on the motion you made? <clears throat> okay. I, what I'm saying, Mr. Privet, is to keep the dust down yes. when you are chipping. Yes. Uh, it wouldn't be that hard, would it, to uh, to uh, put a, put up some sprinkler on it? No, sir. Uh, well, there's a dust suppression suppression system on the machine. Okay. So we, you know, it, it, it <coughs> dust is no with mulch is no different than dust on a dirt road. If it's you know, if we go back there and we grind when it's and it's raining or we've had rain, then there's no dust. It's just not. There's no need to run it. Uh, if it hadn't rained for a month, month and a half, two months, then yeah, we, we would consider running it. 
but you know that's just something that we do uh, you know on a has been kind of basis mayor if council wishes to add anything like that as a condition you can but I think the motion right now is the approval with the four conditions by the planning board unless Councilmember Keziah wishes to add an additional requirement requiring the use of a dust suppression system and or now if you, you got dust depressing on it yes sir and tell me how it works you just run a water hose to it and it runs as the machine is in operation I mean that makes sense yes sir. okay I'm good okay I have a motion and a second any other discussion you're not all in favor uh, all opposed no you may okay one well, opposed by the clerk eat that uh and the mayor you need to have a, then you need to approve a resolution of land development compliance either uh, and i would suggest it's probably then the devout land resolution land development compliance that is consistent with the plan the first one on page 597 you need to approve that as well okay you need a motion for that mayor okay so move. I have a motion for that to have a second second any discussion you're not all in favor uh, any opposed okay thank you mayor. Pass also. Okay. Uh, thank you all thank you all have a nice evening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. do that anyway. Do that anyway. No matter what we decided tonight, we still do 90% of what does your daddy eat ABC visitors? Really? I'm not your lawyer, sir, and the council meeting's not. I'm a nice man. I mean, first class. I understand, sir. I'm not your attorney. I can't advise you on the law. I appreciate that, sir. I have a problem with the uh, the second resolution. I don't have a problem with the fourth resolution. As long as you know, it's not a big deal. That's in the name. All right. We're going to move to item two. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, <laughs> well, I cleared the house out for this one, huh? <laughs> we can ask him to come. <laughs> no, okay. We're good. Um, back in November, council authorized uh, the initial resolution to begin the steps necessary to issue combined enterprise system revenue bonds series 2017. This debt is going to be used to finance various water and sewer projects and the construction of an airplane hangar. These totals, these projects total $13,905,570. Adoption of the series resolution tonight will provide the necessary authorization to complete the steps to issue the enterprise bonds by authorizing the officers of the city to execute the purchase agreement, authorizing the use of the preliminary official statement and the final official statement in connection with the sale of the bonds, and authorize the author officers of the city to act on behalf of the city to complete the transaction and execute all of the necessary documents. Uh, the preliminary interest cost is still at 3.6%, for a period of 25 years, and we anticipate closing on December 21st. The bonds will actually be sold on December 13th. Um, we've already become, begun the steps necessary to issue this debt, and one of the steps that is necessary as part of the process is to solicit updated credit ratings from Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And I'm pleased to announce tonight that Moody's has upgraded the city of Monroe's uh, rating from an A2 to an A1 uh, for this issue. Uh, the outlook is stable, so we're very proud. That's going to save us. 
Good job. Great job. Thanks. It's going to save the city uh, about $100,000 over the life of the issue. And uh, they cited uh, different things for their opinion, such as we've maintained a very strong financial position amid declining debt balances while undertaking a manageable capital improvement plan with no additional debt issuance planned through fiscal year 2021. Uh, they list strengths of having a track record of raising rates as needed within our utilities to make them self-supporting. Um, we have strong financial stewardship reflected by robust debt service coverage and strong liquidity. In other words, we have great reserve balances, as you saw in the presentation of the financial report earlier this evening. And we also have a combined utility with strong operational performance. Um, SMP also gave us their affirmation on their A plus rating and listed similar strengths on our system. So tonight uh, we're requesting that council adopt the series resolution to authorize the issuance of the combined enterprise system revenue bonds series 2017. That's hangers involved in that. You said hanger, did you? Mm-hmm. I understand it, 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 it's already been leased out, is that correct? Where are we at on that hangar? Sir, um, Council, Peter Savalas, airport manager. Uh, the, the hangar has already been talked, we're do, negotiating with three companies right now, trying to bring them over to the large corporate jets. This hangar is actually designed to uh, for that specific market. It's not a, your general aviation type uh, for the small aircraft. This is actually designed to bring corporate jets and their flight crews so, because that's why the office, there's adjoining offices with the structure. You had talked with three different clients? Yes, sir, right now. I thought back some months yeah. back, I thought that, that uh, we had already had a deal for that hangar. Well, no, sir, I, I couldn't he's get a full talking, commitment from him. He's until, talking about the uh, the other hangar, the one for the uh, Sears Arrowwood. Dealer. Yes, sir. Arrowwood, that one is okay, committed. That, that, that's a different hangar. Okay. That one is committed, and it's in under construction right now, actually. Uh, that's the one I'm that's the one Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm up to date. Any other questions for Peter? Okay, here's none. Do you need a motion? I'm looking for a motion. Yes. I'll give it. We need to adopt the resolution. So moved. I have a motion. Second. second. I'm sorry? Second. second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Okay, how about the, did that get the resolution? You're in? good to go, man. Good to go. I'm moving right along. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the uh, the upgrade on our Moody Hot Lately. Thank, Thank you. Yes, we're very proud. I have the next item, too. <laughs> so that's really good. That's called a pay my bills. Good. Okay, item 22, discussion, council discretionary travel budget for the remainder of this year. Um, the purpose of this, the report that's included in your packet is to uh, initiate discussion about the remaining balance of City Council discretionary funds and travel funds for fiscal year 2018. Uh, today, we welcome two members and elected uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Congratulations, everybody. Um, both of these positions, travel and discretionary fund allocations, are being referred to Council for the purpose of determining uh, if replenishment of either positions, travel, and discretionary funds are warranted. Uh, in the beginning of any fiscal year, uh, the mayor is allowed $6,000 for travel, Mayor Pro Tem gets $5,000, and council members are allotted $4,000. And every member on council, it receives $3,000 in discretionary funds for the use towards a public purpose. Uh, there are no discretionary funds remaining from the vacated seats on council. However, there were no expenditures for travel, so there was a $9,000 uh, available balance remaining. Uh, I've made one option that I thought might be viable for council, but you're certainly welcome to do anything you wish uh, to decide on. Uh, my suggestion was to divide the $9,000 by giving the two new council members uh, $1,500 each for discretionary, $2,500 each for travel, 
and the remaining thousand could be provided as a allocation to the new mayor pro tem uh, for travel. Um, like I said, you're welcome to mix it up any way you want. We're just looking for your direction. All right, discussions? Why not? I'll make a motion we accept that recommendation. I have a motion to second. I'll second that. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh. Any opposed? Okay, very good. Uh, item 23, recommendation appointments, reappointments to the commission. <clears throat> the Citizens Appointment Committee met on November 27th. Recommends that council make the following appointments and reappointments. Charlotte Monroe Executive Airport Commission reappoint Howard Hedda to a full term. Charlotte Monroe Executive Airport Commission reappoint John Stevens to a full term. Downtown Advisory Board reappoint RuPaul Doss to a full term. Downtown Advisory Board reappoint Gail Privet to a full term. Monroe Historic District Commission appoint Megan Wozea from alternate to regular member. Monroe Historic District Commission appoint Rich Ali to chair to replace Vicki Edgepeth. Monroe Tourism Development Authority reappoint Brandon Derrick to full term. Monroe Tourism Development Authority reappoint Dan Shive to full term. Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Directors reappoint Chad Griffin to full term. Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Directors reappoint Todd Todd Johnson to full term. Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Directors reappoint Chris Martinez to full term. Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Directors appoint Stephen Coward to full term to replace Marion Holloway. Monroe Union County Economic Development Board of Directors appoint Jeff Duke to full term to replace Patricia Ingram. Parks and Recreation Commission reappoint Kenneth Graham to full term. Parks and Recreation Commission reappoint Angela James to full term. Parks and Recreation Commission reappoint Gail Marshall to full term. Planning Board reappoint Edith Covington to full term. Public Enterprise Committee reappoint Loretta Mellencon to full term. Union County Historic Preservation Commission appoint Dr. Jerry L. Surratt to full term to replace Melvin Ferris. With respect to the Historic District Commission, Mm -hmm. Council approves the appointment of Richard Ali to serve as chair of the commission. Mr. Ali's original seat on the commission will become vacant. If his seat becomes vacant, the committee recommends that the seat be filled through the regular order process. Regular order requests applications from the public, considers new applications along with applications kept on file, and then the Citizens Appointment Committee considering appointments at its next meeting. The next meeting at the committee is scheduled for March 5th, 2018. Following the meeting, recommendations will be made to the full council for appointment. This concludes the recommendations of the Citizens Appointment Committee. Okay. Um, Mayor, I, I need to say that I received a question and a complaint from Mr. Robert Yanichak regarding his not being reappointed to whatever committee he was on. Uh, I didn't attempt to ask the question, but I am, you know, making the making counsel know that he was seemingly upset because he was not reappointed. He stated that he had not missed any meetings and had uh, contributed to the committee. So I just want to make it known that he was displeased. Okay, any other comments? 
Who we adjourn, Mayor? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, we got you, to. You, you, we you through get in motion to either approve this or no. <laughs> <laughs> some got to do. I have a you have a motion. Oh. Yes, I, I have a motion to approve. I have a second. That's right. Here. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Item twenty-four. Public comment period. Anyone here who would like to address the council? Hey, I, I just want to. I just want to reemphasize that this was a unanimous approval tonight by council to recommend the appointments that the citizen appointment committee made on November 27th. Thank All you. Right. Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? Wait, don't move. Mayor, did don't you, move. you'd ask if there were anyone to speak oh. for well, I, yeah, yeah, but public I, comment, and I don't think you heard anything Land until O'Callaghan. Mr. Andy Mayor Bird, Tim Anderson I I made his statement. So the question I would ask you, sir, is just asking him if there's anyone here to speak for public comment. I'm assuming the answer is none because it's staff and a couple of other folks. <laughs> Was anyone here who would like to speak? <laughs> Mayor. Here none. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Got it. I have a second. <laughs> second. All in favor? Uh, we adjourn. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas to everyone. I need some. You got us on overtime, brother. Yeah, he don't take off for a day. Hey there. Looking good. How's the boy doing? How the heck are you? Good. Tell him hello for him. Huh? That's hey, come here, Cap. No, wait a minute. You, no, no, you try and leave. I can let you go. Tell him hello. Met at 5:30.